Shall I continue further? The uh, audio. The... It was not. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One sec. One sec. One sec. Yeah. One yeah. sec. One sec. Okay. Dr. Kamal, please wait and they are showing it again. It okay. was already, uh, yeah, yeah, just please wait. No, oh, fine. Fine, ma'am. Continue. tradition of maintaining a sacred notion light is a universal symbol of knowledge and understanding let's all together participate in the ceremony of kutu vikku digitally kalyanam arogyam dhana sampada शुभम कुरुत्वं कल्याणम् आरोग्यं फलसंपदः शत्रुबुद्धि विनाशाय दीपज्योतिर्नमोस्तुते दीपज्योतिर्नमोस्तुते शुभम कुरुत्वं कल्याणम् आरोग्यं फलसंपदः शुभम कुरुत्वं कल्याणम् आरोग्यं फलसं thank you so much god created someone who is wise knows to make sacrifices and never gets so an epitome of beauty 
wisdom, and care. Theme is the gesture of our webinar is to empower diversity in science, which is really a need of the art. Now I would like to welcome our charismatic convener, our empowered figure, a great researcher, an eminent scholar, Dr. Helen P. Kavitha, professor, head of the Department of Chemistry, SRMIST Ramapuram Chennai, and vice president, South Zone Association of Chemistry Teachers for the welcome address to the August gathering. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. A wonderful and a very pleasant evening to one and all connected here. History is full of women who have made enormous contribution in the field of science. Today, we are all connected here to celebrate, to appreciate and acknowledge the contribution of women in the field of science. Yes, it is very proud to organize this international webinar on women in science. And ACT organized Women in Science program last year, which received a lot of appreciation. And because of this overwhelming response we received in last year, ACT has made this event as a flagship annual event of Association of Chemistry Teachers. As the convener of the program, I am very feel proud and privileged to welcome all the participants for this international webinar. First and foremost, I welcome our respected Professor Bridesh Pare, sir, president of ACT for this webinar. Under his able leadership, ACT is doing a lot of activities for the benefit of students, scholars, and faculty members. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And it's my honor and privilege to welcome our most respectful Professor D.V. Prabhu, sir, an enthusiastic leader and a source of inspiration to all of us. Under his marvelous leadership, ACT is successfully traveling in its glorious path for more than two decades, contributing remarkably to chemical sciences and chemistry in particular. A very warm well welcome to you, Professor. And I wholeheartedly welcome our respected Dr. M. Murali Krishna, Dean and uh, Engineering and Technology, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramabaram Campus, a competent leader and the able administrator. We are honored by your presence, sir, today. On behalf of Association of Chemistry Teachers, I extend a very warm welcome to you, sir. My warm and my very special welcome to all the resource person, eminent scientists, who have made significant contributions in their respective fields and who are all going to enthrall us with their beautiful presentation and a powerful presentation. On behalf of the Association of Chemistry Teacher, I welcome Dr. Shupa Hanuva, President, Chemical Society of Thailand, Department of Chemistry, Kasat University, Thailand. We welcome you, ma'am. And it's my honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Lena Francis, Principal, Indian School, Altap, uh, Muscat, Omen. Welcome you, ma'am, on behalf of Association of Chemistry Teacher. And I wholeheartedly welcome Dr. Sonu Gandhi, Scientist D, National Institute of Animal Biotechnology, Hyderabad. Welcome you, ma'am. And it's my honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Nishima Wangu, Assistant Professor, Applied Sciences Chemistry, UIET, Punjab University, Chandigarh. On behalf of ECT, ACT, I welcome you all. I welcome Professor Swaminathan, sir, EC member, ACT South Zone, who will be delivering a of thanks for this webinar session. Welcome you, sir. And I welcome all the respected EC members of ACT. I could see many of them. And I welcome you all for this webinar. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, for gracing this occasion with your wonderful presence. And last but not the least, I welcome all the enthusiastic part participants who have joined here for this webinar from different parts of the country and from abroad. I welcome one and all, welcome. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your warm welcome. Thank you so much. We are really delighted today to have with us a very special lucid personality, Professor Brijesh Pare, Head, Department of Chemistry, Mother of Science, PG College, Ujjain, and President of Association of Chemistry Teacher. He is a pillar behind the entire webinar. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Brijesh Pare for his presidential address. Over to you, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meet Kamal. I'm, I'm audible. Yes, yes sir, you are. Okay. Very much. So, uh, at the very outset, you know, I, I welcome once again Professor Supa Hanoboa, uh, who is the president of uh, Chemical Society of Thailand, a very senior professor. Dr. Lena Francis, a very popular principal in Oman, Dr. Neshima and Dr. Sonu Gandhi. Uh, both are from INIAS, you know, that they are very young scientists in India and uh, they are working very nicely. So it will be really a pleasure to listen to all the other speakers. Uh, Professor D.V. Prabhu, uh, the General Secretary of Association of Chemistry Teachers, who is a pillar and a support for all these kind of activities. Professor Kavita, the coordinator of this program, Dr. Meet Kamal, who is the master of ceremony, Professor Swaminathan, and all uh, my, uh, my colleagues and friends in ACT, Association of Chemistry Teachers. Uh, in fact, this program, you know, like uh, we started last year, and uh, the purpose of this program is just to, to listen, you know, the leading, the scientists and professors, uh, particularly women um, uh, side, you know, like to, to understand and to know uh, their challenges, you know, and to, to arrive at such a, a higher position, you know, what, because see, every society has, you know, uh, some or the other kind of a uh, the gender bias, you know, and uh, to overcome all those difficulties and to to achieve this um, uh, this pinnacle, you know, the height of the the career, you know. So definitely, and that will be very very uh, inspiring for all the young uh, the girls and women, and of course to the boys and girls. Uh, my my perception, and in most of the universities. Uh, there are more uh, male students uh, than female students on science courses. So what is, the, what is the reason of this, you know, what could be done to balance out the number? I, I hope, you know, probably you are having the same uh, kind of uh, observations. In, in higher education, uh, and particularly the science subjects are typically dominated by male students. And this, you know, the negatively impacts the, the world of work. That is, I mean, the uh, the workplace, you know, particularly related to science, uh, because, you know, there are fewer number of uh, females uh, in, in science and particularly in STEM also, I mean, technology and engineering factors also. We need to explore the reasons for the lack of the, the gender diversity in science and, and then we need to suggest ways to create the equal opportunity in this area. And this could be one of the reasons of doing this program. So when our speakers will come out, you know, when they will speak about their own research, of course, but at the same time, you know, we expect from them that they will be discussing some of these kind of things, you know, that what, what are the, what are kind of uh, the, the bias they faced and how did they overcome all those things? Uh, the most likely reason for the imbalance, you know, what I see is that, you know, the society reinforces the idea uh, that boys and girls have different interests and abilities. And we see this form of, from a very, uh, from the very early age, when little boys are given cars, you know, and while the girls are given dolls and the boys are encouraged to build things, whereas the girls learn to care for others. And later on, you know, we, when we are told that the girls are better at languages and boys have the better, you know, the special awareness. In fact, there is no evidence, of course, you know, uh, particularly the biological difference between the sexes, you know, that make one gender more talented than the another at a particular subject. I think it is the society, you know, and not the nature uh, that tells us the girls should uh, favor arts and humanities and leave maths and physics for the boys. Uh, moreover, you know, like uh, these are the things and coupled with, uh, you know, the lack of the, the positive female role models uh, for youngsters. They see doing science, I mean, related jobs. But I, I think, I mean, this thing is, uh, covering up, I mean, and a more number of uh, um, the role models now we have, but still looks, you know, that uh, we need to have more. And uh, there, is, there is an unfortunate perception that the, the scientists are, you know, that they are geeky, have, you know, the poor social skills or that their work is lonely and detached from the rest of the world. And these are false stereotype uh, the portrayed, you know, by the media. Uh, but, they, they, but they mean that the girls do not identify the scientists and see science as an an unappealing career path. If girls saw more positive female role models in science, it would give them more confidence and a greater sense of belonging in those subjects. And given these points, I think it is important to, to tackle this issue right from a child, child's early education. And by the time the young women are at university, you know, it may probably uh, late you know, to disprove that the view that the science is not for them. Uh, therefore, for, I mean, uh, uh, very young children, you know, the the gender neutral play needs to be encouraged. You know, that is what I feel. Uh, as children get older, you know, the both the education system and the media must raise awareness 
uh, or female achievements in the field of science, as well as exposing them to, to more diverse set of characters in books and films and, and other places. So we need to find ways to show young girls that science is fun, interesting, and most importantly, uh, they can also do it. So thank you very much once again. I once again welcome everyone to all of our uh, STEM speakers uh, from Thailand, from Oman, and from India. And we are looking forward to listen to you all very um, uh, enthusiastically. So thank you, thank you once again, and hopefully uh, uh, some of the speakers definitely will throw some light on uh, some of the issues I raised. You know that why there is a gender bias and how to to overcome it. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your enlightening words. And I would like to say a saying for you that uh, which really fits for you: surround yourself with people who are going to lift you higher. And I think. You are the best example for that. Your personality really reflects. Thank you so much, sir. Now, events like this cannot be accomplished without the blessings of our mentors. We are privileged to have with us the eloquent personality, Professor D.V. Prabhu, Journal Secretary, Association of Chemistry Teachers, Wilson College, Mumbai, on this platform. It's a proud moment for me to welcome our Journal Secretary, Professor D.V. Prabhu, sir, to address our August gathering. Over to you, sir. Prabhu, sir. Prabhu, sir, please unmute. Unmute yourself. Prabhu, sir, please unmute yourself. Your speaker is off, sir. Speaker, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah you're yeah, audible, yes, sir. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Meet Kam for your nice introduction. Uh, good evening, Professor Helen Kubia, Professor Bridges Pari, our very eminent speakers and all the delegates. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome all the delegates to this international webinar on women in science. At the onset, let me first congratulate Professor Helen Kavita and her colleagues for planning and organizing this international webinar on women in science. This is the second time we are having it, and the success of the first webinar last year encouraged it to make it a flagship event of ACT. This webinar is a tribute to all the women scientists for their valuable contributions to science. The contributions of women scientists, unfortunately, are not well recognized. And therefore, this webinar assumes great importance and great relevance for all of us. Talking of women scientists and their contributions, Madam Mary Curie is a role model for all of us. You are all aware she won two Nobel Prizes, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903 for the discovery of radioactivity, uh, whose anniversary we are celebrating this year. And this was shared with her husband, Pierre Curie, and of course, Henry Bequirrell. And Madame Curie won the second prize in 1911 for discovery of polonium and radium. And see the wonderful thing, her daughter, Irene Joliot, and her son-in-law, Frederick Joliot, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1935 for artificial radioactivity. And this is a family which has got four Nobel laureates. What a great family. Madame Curie was also the first lady to be given the PhD in Europe and in the world. In 2011, we celebrated the International Year of Chemistry and we organized several activities which were listed with IUPAC and UNESCO. Talking of the Indian contributions, Yamuna Joshi was the first women doctor of India way back in 1865. And she died very young at the age of 22. Nikki Amal, the very eminent botanist, Iravati Bey, whose specialization was Chatterjee in the field of medicinal chemistry, 
and the first lady to be given a DSC by the Indian University. Seema Chatterjee is again a very well-known name in our chemistry circles. Anna Mani, who worked in the field of meteorology Dynamics. Kamala Bhattoni was the first Indian lady to get a PhD and specialized in supramolecular chemistry and protein chemistry. So we have with us certain role models upon which we can build. Association of Chemistry Teachers is very proud to be associated with this event. Uh, and I would like to again welcome Dr. Sonu Gandhi, Dr. Lina Francis, Dr. Nishima Wanchu, and Dr. Supa Hanoboa, who are now the role models for our young scientists. The Association of Chemistry Teachers is a national registered body of chemistry educators and was founded way back. Back in 2000, excellence in chemistry education through its many activities, such as national and international conferences, an annual national convention of chemistry teachers, training workshops for teachers, students, industry chemists, chemistry competitions for school and college students, and a concept test for BSc students. Some of our recent activities are a research convention, workshop for designing quality information, orientation work for competitive examinations, which are all now our flagship activities. The ACT is actively connected with the Indian National and International Chemistry Olympiads. And many of our members are participating in the various stages of the examinations. The association also lends academic support to a peer-reviewed chemistry journal, GP, Globalized Research Journal of Chemistry, which is abstracted and indexed in Chemical Abstracts, CAA, USA. Every year, ACT onwards honors and felicitates the outstanding chemistry teachers of India for their distinguished contributions to chemistry education and research. And I, I am proud to say that several of these awardees are ladies. So as Professor Vijesh Party rightly said, we have to encourage the participation of girls in science, especially in the uh, uh, physical sciences. And all of us have to think what we should do to encourage this participation. We have a lot of problems, especially in the rural areas where students, especially girls, are denied education. So let us all think about this problem, as Professor Pare said, and try to do our best. Association of Chemistry Teachers is uh, uh, thinking of many such programs, and we are prompted to take some action very soon. It's a matter of pride for us that we have a large network of uh, members all over India who are actively involved in our activities. And we have several honorary members and patrons, including Professor Sienna Rao, Bharat Ratna. And I would like to wish the webinar great success and record my appreciation of the efforts of Professor Helen Kavita and all members of the South Zone of ACT. I wish the participants fruitful interactions over the next two days. And we are very proud that there are very eminent faculty from whom we will learn a lot. Thank you and my best wishes. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words of wisdom. Some people really become the most important members uh, of the society because their professional efforts really affect the fate of the earth and you are one among them. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable presence. Now it's time to welcome a very dynamic and energetic personality, Dr. M. Mulli Krishnan, 
Dean Engineering and Technology, SRMIST, Ramapuram, Chennai, the energy behind the webinar for his felicitation address. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening to, am I audible, madam? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening to everybody present here in this online session. Uh, honorable patrons, Professor Rajesh Parasar, President, Association of Chemistry Teachers, Professor D.V. Prabhu, sir, General Secretary, Association of Chemistry Teachers, and our beloved Professor, Head of the Department Chemistry, Dr. Helen P. Kavita, madam and the eminent speakers for today's program, Dr. Supa Hanuma Goba from Thailand, Dr. Lena Francis, Dr. Sonu Gandhi from uh, National Institute of Animal Biotechnology, Hyderabad, Dr. Nishima Vengo from uh, Punjab University, Chandigarh, and the other participants, faculty members, eminent personalities, uh, very, very good evening to everybody present here in this online session, today's webinar on women in science. I feel very happy that whenever we see the word women, uh, particularly women will play a major role in uh, entire our life, I can say that. Not only you, we are talking about science, when we celebrate about Women's Day in our campus, we talk about women in all the areas not only science, engineering, technology, day-to-day -day life. With their expertise only, we are living actually day-to-day -day with a smooth function. Without their support, we cannot do anything in this particular entire life career. And in fact, the two speakers talk about the role of the women in science. In fact, it's a fact we have to accept that it has been gradually decreasing. In fact, not even it is less than 30% of the entire world, if you see, talk about the, uh, in terms of research, technology, even in academics and everywhere, everywhere etc. When we talk about the women in science, first, uh, the speaker was quoting about the, uh, the first women in India, science is uh, uh, Seema Chatterjee, madam, who has actually received the PhD from organic chemistry from University of Calcutta. The similarly, when we talk about international, that uh, speaker, Dr. Prabhu sir was telling about the uh, Mary Curie. Uh, in fact, when I studied, you know, in the science, particularly in, uh, in, in uh, uh, 10 plus 2, in, you know, in intermediate, etc. When we studied about the physics, we will heard about this Mary Curie, uh, very eminent person who has received this uh, Nobel Prize in physics and as well as chemistry, and she's the inventor of, you know, radium and polonium, and her name only actually, in fact, it has been kept in a periodic table when I see that. I'm a little bit afraid in chemistry subject because chemistry is a very tough subject, so we're consisting of so many reactions, etc. So we used to buy her the reactions, you know, like hydrogen, oxygen, what will happen, etc. But however, after the completion of our courses, we find is a very, very interesting, uh, may, many of this one. And uh, in fact, uh, we are talking about women in science, etc. The entire women and science is in our SRM Ramapuram campus. Uh, I'll say that, you know, the biggest asset for us is uh, Dr. Kavita Madam, who is actually professor and is also research coordinator and uh, in the chemistry department. We have a physics also, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shakila Madam is actually physics and English sir, Dr. Rama Madam and similar way my, I mean uh, for uh, uh, physics sir, Dr. L. Sudha Madam and we have civil engineering Madhavi Madam, we have biomedical, we have everywhere is a woman in this in particularly in our campus, more than 50% of our strength, I'll say extend to 60% is entire woman only. I feel very happy that because the, nowadays actually there is no difference of you know gender or men or women. So they are equally capable. You, sometimes I can say that actually, in fact, a little bit, you know, uh, I mean, compared with the gents, they are a little bit uh, better in terms of communication, in terms of, you know, now everywhere we are badly need of the communication, you know, data communication requirement. 
uh, and in fact i feel very happy being a head of the institutions for entire i have more than 12 13 departments the majority more than 60 to 70 percent as uh, the heads of the departments are women only but uh, i'm able to capable to get because they're very good the administrators actually they are the teachers first of all they are very good administrators and with their support only we are able to achieve so many achievements you know when i go for mba when i go for nat when i go for you know university status wherever this thing we seek their support only i feel very happy i will also appreciating the uh, kavita madam for organizing this particular wonderful uh, I mean, webinar international webinar that too we are bringing very eminent personal personalities on this single you know i must be very thankful to the technology also so the because of the covid 19 we switch over from offline to online the greatest advantage is we'll be able to see the eminent personalities we can share their technology views etc otherwise uh, physically meeting with these all people is very very difficult so i must be very thankful to to the technology where i can access uh, eminent persons in this online and uh, i my sincere request to the participants also please kindly spare your time i can say that this is the right time in the evening pleasant evening you can uh, you can have a uh, good look on to the speakers which are actually going to deliver the valuable lectures and which will be very very useful and once again i am very fortunate to be a part of this today's program with all the eminent personalities thank you sir thank you madam uh, for giving this uh, opportunity thank you one and all Thank you so much, sir, for such a notable address. And I really congratulate you that you have such an esteemed institution with such an empowered woman fraternity with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So now it's time to start with our uh, technical session. I would like to request Dr. Kavi Priya, Assistant Professor, Department of Chemistry, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram, Chennai, to introduce our eminent speaker. Over to you, Kavi, ma'am. Yes. A very good evening to one and all present here. It is a proud privilege for me to introduce Dr. Supa, Supa Hanuba, Professor of Department of Chemistry, Kasarsot University, Bangkok, Thailand, and President of the Chemical Society of Thailand. Dr. Supa obtained BSc in Chemistry and MSc in Physical Chemistry from Chulalong University, Thailand, and PhD from Innsbruck University, Austria. She pursued postdoctoral study in the area of 3D QS AR advanced technique for drug design at University of Innsbruck, Austria, under the supervision of Professor V. M. Rowe. Dr. Supa has held various positions like the head of the Department of Chemistry, the member of Kassersort University Council, and the Dean of Faculty of Science, Kassersort University. Dr. Supa has obtained various awards and recognitions, such as Young Scientist Award in 1997. TWAS Young Scientist Award in Thailand in 2002, L'Oreal for Women in Science in 2006. Her research interest includes computer-aided molecular design, natural products and drug discovery, protein-based drug design, bioinformatics, cheminformatics and data science, conducting polymers, polyaromatic hydrocarbons and nanomaterials. Dr. Supa has published about 170 papers, five book chapters and one United States patent. Once again, on behalf of the Association of Chemistry Teachers and Department of Chemistry, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, I welcome you, ma'am, and request you to take over the session. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to share uh, my slide. Okay. Okay, good evening. Uh, everybody, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Bridget Pear, the president of Association of Chemistry Teacher Mumbai, and also the dean of SRM Institute of Science and Technology for very kind invitation and provide me a very opportunity, very important opportunity to, to share about my experience. And I like to, to give a, a talk about the inspiration driven responsible science for sustainability, because we are now in a very disruptive time and also many things that happen. 
So we have to look forward to the futures. However, um, I have to thank Dr. Haren uh, Kawita also that uh, she suggests me that I should uh, talk about something that derived from myself, okay? So uh, I'm really happy to join this international webinar on women in science. This is the first time that I joined the activity in Mumbai. Actually, it is my dream that I would like to come here to Mumbai. I have heard about this uh, city and also India. In the near future, I do hope that I can come myself to India, okay? So my talk will be inspiration in science. And if you look, at the left-hand side, I think everybody know about um, Albert Einstein, but his message in, in this picture is very important. Life is like riding a bicycle and to keep your balance, you must keep moving. I think this is very important. Also in my life, I, I have to balance about life and work. As a woman, yes, Everybody know that we have to be responsible in many, many things, but more importantly, we have to balance, okay? And the second picture in this middle uh, screen, you can see that very impressive group of the scientists, uh, the participant in the fifth Solway conference on quantum mechanics in 1927. And this conference is very important uh, and continue until now, okay? But this picture show us about uh, 29 person among this, almost everybody won the Nobel Prize. So very happy to see only one lady over there, you know about her, Madame Marie Curie. However, on the right-hand side, this is, the picture of Professor Richard Feynman, who is the big name in nanotechnology. However, he was very good teacher in physics. For sure, he won the Nobel Prize in physics, but he really loved teaching, okay? And from his statement, the more you teach, the better you learn. And teaching is a powerful tool to learning. I do agree with Professor Feynman because I myself, I have learned a lot since um, very young. And then when I start the career in university, I also teach the students, also create my lab and meet many people, collaborators and uh, connection with many, many organizations. And every day we can learn. And I think that being a teacher is very important for our young students to inspire them, to make them love science because science can bring us for a sustainable future, okay? And I like to draw your attention to this picture which everybody know her, Madame Marie Curie. She was a she was a woman from Poland and moved to Paris. And then she worked in the lab, in laboratory and as the assistant professor. And then he did very breakthrough in science. And in 1903, she won physics uh, Nobel Prize. Okay, but after some, some years later, she proved the application of radioactive compounds that can kill uh, cancer. And later on, she obtained Nobel Prize in chemistry. I think Madame Marie Curie uh, is our role model as a woman in science. Nobody like her. I mean, nobody can be the woman that obtained uh, twice Nobel Prize especially in very tough discipline like physics and chemistry. But she did that. And later on about her family, she is still, I mean, her families, I mean, her young granddaughters still uh, around and very, how to say, 
concerned about science research. I myself met her granddaughter sometime in the year 2011 in Paris. And it was very um, impressive about her life. I mean, Madame Marie Curie. She quite unique. And from the, from the message that show you here, be less curious about people and more curious about ideas. I think um, our time right now that we connect people via internet, via social media, and we face every day about a hate speech and we waste our time about something that probably not so much important. And sometimes we, um, how to say, uh, do nothing, okay? But for Madame Marie Curie, she hint at about, just think about the idea, okay? Think a little bit more deeper in some particular case. And then we can find out the pain, how to, sol to find the solution of the pain point. So I think this is the unique of women in science. So I think back since um, 35 years when I did a chemistry senior project, when I gonna to graduate, I have to do some science project in 1986. And I had an advisor, associate professor Rasana Atakip, uh -huh, who suggests me to do something that think about the value added waste from salt field. So in Thailand, we have the salt field like this, and you can see that there are some waste solution. So when I got this problem, my advisor did not tell me anything. I have to think everything by myself. At the end, I can come up with the quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis and propose that from the solution from the salt field that was the waste, we can find out some good materials like magnesium sulfate and copper sulfate. Okay, and can be something like materials for uh, powder production in the industry. Okay, and then I pass the examination. But what I have learned is that to do research, it's very important that we have to think about the research topic. And we, we have to do something that we have to be independent, okay? Think something deeper and do something that independent. And from, from the skill of scientific uh, problem solving from the senior project, it is the scientific problem solving that we have been applied for everyday life. Start from why the problem and some hypothesis or concepts we have to do literature survey and find the gold. And then we have to plan for the strategy to win the goal, to reach the goal and practice. Do something verify and prove analysis and conclusion. Okay, this just the thing that science work, scientific work teach us to do. But later on, I found that myself I can apply this kind of scientific problem solving in every daily life. It is, it is sincere say from my uh, deep impressive with the senior project indeed. And when I found the uh, very critical problems, always we have to sit down, sit down and then think, and then use scientific problem solving to help. I think this is very important. So we need this inspiration to our student. And I did it. 
I start um, academic staff in chemistry department in 1991 after graduation. And then I always teach my students to, to think about how to solve your problems and it works, okay? Anyway, the turning point of my career uh, was inspired my advisor, the same advisor. One day, she just talked about her traveling in Europe from Switzerland to Germany, and she was alone, and she could not speak German. And then it's very tough traveling for her. But anyway, there are some exciting also in the trip. So this is very inspiration to me because I like to go to Europe to see the train. And you know that this is a turning point because after graduation, actually I uh, spent some time in garment factory, but I didn't enjoy with the career as a chemist in the factory. So then I made a decision to continue the study in Chulalongkorn University graduate school in physical chemistry. And after that, continue PhD in Innsbruck University. And so here is my Innsbruck University. And then I, um, after that, my committee of the examination, my senior uh, committee told me that, Supa, you have to do research. My senior committee told me that I need to do research. Therefore, after that, I always do research. And then I found myself in joy. I found myself passion with research. And my research is about computer aided molecular design, drug discovery research for the very uh, important diseases like anti HIV, malaria, dengue, cancer, TB, antibiotics, and Alzheimer's. So from um, 1994, after graduation, PhD, uh, I start the drug discovery research in the lab in chemistry department. At that time, it was very, very tough because nothing, okay? Nothing. I have to find um, opportunity to do research by collaborations. Anyway, some time later, we produce uh, some publications and then we got funding and then we got the graduate students and then we have a big team and collaborations. So based on my research experience, computer aided molecular design, we also do some kind of molecular modeling of protein based uh, molecular modeling and design and uh, some time later, we applied the bioinformatics. And in the drug discovery research, we also uh, apply the expertise to nanomaterials, to advanced optical materials. And it's indeed, you know that research never end. So our research group have been uh, larger and larger and some of my graduate students also spin off and they are growing up and very smart. That makes me really happy. So these are some examples of drug enzyme interactions based on molecular simulations and quantum chemical calculations, molecular dynamic simulations and so on, okay? Um, we also connect to the natural products drug discovery research. And right now we try to um, study the medicinal plant and microorganism based on innovation. I mean that we, we have to change some classical extraction methodology to be green process, but not perfect now, but we are trying to, okay? And also use some kind of uh, computer technologies not only molecular modeling, but also bioinformatics, uh, learning machine, and multi-variate analysis. 
And then we connect to omics technologies like genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics, okay? But um, I mean, I connect to other colleagues to make uh, the complete whole of picture and really enjoy that. Right now we apply the uh, AI and uh, machine learning to the analysis of drug and enzyme interactions. So if you are interested in, I can give a talk in more details, but probably not for today, just give you some idea about my uh, expertise. And I like to tell you that uh, for about 30 years in research and in academic position in universities, I have um, some of mentors that I respect them as my mentors. And you may know that mentor is important for, for us, okay? The first one is Professor Peter Walshen from University of Vienna. He is the theoretical chemist and very kind man. He helped me to uh, join, co-advise my PhD student. And these two ladies are my former PhD graduates. Right now, they're already um, very smart. Both of them are the professor in chemistry in the university, okay, in Sivinton, in Tamasat University and Ubun Rajatani University. And here are my family, my husband, my little boy and little girl. But right now, both children, they are already graduates. Another mentor is Professor Katie Morokuma, who is very keen on quantum chemistry. And and his uh, former professor, his professor is Professor Fu Kui, who obtained the Nobel laureate in chemistry, okay? So Professor Keti Morokuma was very kind man. He support the young people. He support my students to learn about techniques, really, really deep uh, quantum chemical calculation techniques uh, at the Emory University. And also his former PhD graduates in Japanese. Right now, all of them are professor in uh, Ibaraki University, like Professor Seti Mori and some uh, young professor. We are friends. We all know each other and we help each other to, to um, advise the young student. And you can see that these are my students actually, and they are very smart based on the collaboration in research. I do hope that um, this scientific community is normal. International um, scientific environment are the same around the world. We have to meet, we have to brainstorming like today, we have a webinar, even uh, uh, we have uh, COVID-19, but we can, share our idea and experience. Not only visiting in the conference or meetings, but we also learn some cultures that I really happy, I really impressive with, to learn the people about uh, their thought, their culture, their trad tradition, and also some kind of good food. And I'm sure that in Mumbai, in India, okay, there are so many delicious food and many of cultures that we can learn from each other. And many of times that I brought the student to the conference, which uh, it was very enjoyable time for me really to bring the young people like master degree and PhD to Nanjing, uh, to Singapore, to uh, uh, Japan, and some of my students also obtain some awards. I think we are the same. We are proud of them. And every time that our students have been graduated, it makes me very happy because I see the future. They all are our future, okay? So this is one of the things that I think being a teacher in chemistry is the key of sustainable future that we produce the high quality graduates, high quality students for our society. 
not only that, when, when we went sometime, I were in um, Angkor Wat for conference and sightseeing for some time. And also this plant, it, it is the Diptolo Carpasia plant. Probably you know about this. It's located in tropical countries. And I also investigate some active compounds from the uh, stem bark of this plant. So I found it in uh, Cambodia. So very nice. And also some sculptures, uh, some construction from ancient people. And I'm sure that in India, you are very rich in cultures and tradition, long history, okay? And here also my group in Department of Chemistry, Kasetsat University, and you can see that most of them are female, okay? <laughs> really little uh, that uh, a man uh, study chemistry in Thailand is dominant by women, okay? And um, sometimes we have a trip to Ayutthaya. Every year we have a trip, but it's a pity two years we have no trip due to COVID-19. And these are the uh, women inside, Laureate Women Inside Laureate meeting. So I'm very happy uh, to be promoted the importance of women in science around the world right now, okay? So I have not much time, but I think I like to talk a little bit about my experience to meet the people who obtain Nobel Laureates. Um, only three, from Israel that I would, would like to give you some point. I impressive with Israel because um, the medical research are very uh, advancement and also the Israel uh, so-called startup nation due to basic science. First one, Professor Aaron Chaishanover. He is a medical doctor, but after some years in the hospital, he faced the problem of cancer his patient uh, of cancer. Then he quit from um, being the medical doctor to be PhD candidates and do research. He would like to fight with the cancer. And then he bre his breakthrough is about the ubiquity mediated protein for personalized medicine, which is very famous right now that we try to fight with cancer by using personalized medicine. And the reason that Professor Shaichanova told me is that because of his teacher, in high school teacher, who brought him and his friend to the garden to see the beautiful nature, and then uh, uh, inspire him to love biology. That's why he quit the job and do research. And this is very important. I just think myself about the teacher who inspired me, okay? And I also inspire you to think about that. Probably you may have some teacher who inspire you to love science. The same is true. We have to inspire our young people, young students, okay? The second Nobel laureate is Professor Adayona. Sorry. Um, I will talk a little bit for some minutes and then, yeah. Ada Yonat is very impressive lady. Her work is about crystallography and she break through in understanding of the structure and function of ribosome. And this is very tough work. She said that her work is very hard work, very tough. Really ribosome is very complex structure, but finally she fight with it. She can crystallize it and then she can understand that. This is very impressive. And from the story of Ada Yonat, I have learned that she is just a, a woman. She is a woman who never give up. And she balanced her life about work and family. She has a big family. She has a granddaughter and grandchildren. And she said that. Right now, she, she is very happy about family, okay? So women in science, we can do everything, even the tough work, but we have to balance our life and we have to not to give up. The next one is Professor 
um, Dan Shekman, who, found, who break through in uh, quartzite crystal. So you can see that quartzite crystal is the crystalline materials that lacking of the repeating structures. But these materials can bring to some special properties and can be applied to many things in the field of food, health, energy. The most important is that Professor Dan Checkman um, taught the course entrepreneurships for 30 years. And he said that his class is full of students. The student would like to follow his lecture, thousands of students, really fantastic. And he's been off company and he said, technological entrepreneurship is the key to the world peace and prosperity. This is the title of his lecture at the conference in Bangkok. And then I invite him to give lecture at Kasesat University. Um, why should we teach technological entrepreneurship in university, especially as early as possible? Because the students, the young people, they should know about entrepreneurship, should know about innovation. And here are the high school students that follow his lecture, the students of about five to 600 students, and they are in English. In Thailand, we are not used to uh, English, but the high school students right now, they are really very smart. Okay, so we look in the future, next 30 years, um, the population will reach 10,000 people, crisis in water, climate, food production, emerging disease, and good health. So it's time for our responsibility to take care of the environment by use the um, responsible science. So you may um, know about the SDG, okay? But the most important is that Next year, next year will be the International Year of Basic Science for Susten Sustainable Development because we cannot reach SDG without basic science and chemistry is that. So I think we need to inspire our people, our students to love science, to love chemistry and to know about the pain point 17 pain point in SDG cycle like this, we have to use chemistry for the challenging of clean air, sustainable energy, eco-friendly products, safe water, healthy food, dependable medicine and advanced materials. These are our responsibility to train our students. I think so. In Thailand, I like to give you um, information about the uh, sufficiency economy philosophy that King Rama the Nine, who was the father of the present king, gave this philosophy to Thai people that we need the land and in the land we can manage the area to plant, to, to have the pond to stock the water, to live in, and then we can produce the food from plant or our animals, or if we have more, we can sell and get the money, okay? This is a very simple uh, philosophy, but it works in Thailand. And for Thailand, 4.0 is the national agenda that we promote the bioeconomy, circular economy, and green economy to meet the sustainable development goal by 2030, and also application of artificial intelligence in all sector. And these are the um, bioeconomy that we base on natural resources. Yeah, in India also, we have a lot that we can do it, train it to be valuable and to be green by chemistry, okay? Um, I have just two slides next, and I like to talk about the education. I think education is the most important issues for our people, our young people. And the Chemical Society of Thailand, we organized the small scale chemistry workshop for high school teachers in ASEAN. 
to Myanmar, to Cambodia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. So we train small scale chemistry. I think everybody know about this technique that we use only small equipment, but can explain the chemistry reaction, thermodynamics, kinetics, some kind of change, okay? And then we train the group of the high school teacher, um, about 100 of teacher each countries. And we provide a small scale chemistry box and then the teacher can uh, practice by themselves and then they can brought this uh, equipment to teach their student. Very enjoyable. And this one, we just um, went to Vietnam, okay? But last year and this year, we cannot go in <laughs> ASEAN due to COVID, sorry for that. But we train the high school teacher by our webinars, also work, okay? So lifelong learning for sustainable future is very important. And then we, we know that the more we learn, the more we earn, okay? And can skill for futures that we have to practice and we have to teach to train our young people. At the end, take home message for today is that I would like to emphasize as a chemistry teachers, education is important for young people for their future life. And the teachers are the key persons who can inspire our young people, okay? And life is tough. The work that we have being teacher, we have the passion, even this is very tough work and never give up. Some pain points around us can bring to research and some innovation can happen to solve our problems. So I'd like to thank you all for your kind attention and hope to see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an insightful session of yours. It was you. really uh, great to know about your exciting journey from graduate to your research and the way you told to develop the research oriented attitude. That was really great. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> so now it's time to move towards to listen to our next uh, speaker of today. Uh, I would now like to request Dr. P. Arati. Assistant Professor, Department of Chemistry, SRMIST, Ramapuram, Chennai, to please introduce our eminent resource person. Thank you, ma'am. A pleasant evening to one and all gathered here. I'm very grateful to introduce our today's guest, Dr. Sonu Gandhi, ma'am. Ma'am is presently a scientist D DPT, National Institute of Animal Biotechnology, Hyderabad. Ma'am has an outstanding academic record with a research experience of more than 15 years. Ma'am, she pursued postdoctoral research fellow from 2010 to 2014 in Italy and visiting scientists from 2014 to 2015, Department of Material Science and Engineering, University of Washington, USA, assistant professor from 2015 to 2018, Amity University, Noida. At present, ma'am is a scientist D and I at the National Institute of Animal Biotechnology, Hyderabad. She has held the, the position of member of India National Young Academy of Sciences, Young Associative uh, of Indian Academy of Sciences, Executive Council member of Biosensor Society of India, member of American Chemical Society, and member of Royal Society of Chemistry, USA, and lifetime member of World Research Council, Associate Board member of the Open Nanomedicine Journal, and member of Indian Association of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Ma'am has many awards to her name from 2007 to 2021. Award of Senior Research Fellowship from CSIR in 2007. Best Young Investigator Award at IIT Varanasi in 2017. DPT BioCare Women Scientist Award in 2016. And CERN ACR Early Career Award 2016. And Distinguished Speaker Award in 2018. Ma'am is elected as a Young Associate of Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, elected as a member of Indian National Young Academy of Sciences in 2021. Ma'am has received the Said Women Excellence Award. 
Nam has published more than 45 research papers in international journals with high impact and nine patents. Total impact factors 243 and citation 1161, H index 20 and I10 index 27. Nam has received various funded projects, a CERN ECR, approved cost of 35 lakhs, DPT Biocat, DST INSA, Young Scientist, and CERN EDFA, approved cost of 36 lakhs. DPT EMR and CERB WEA and CERB CRG. We are very much delighted to have such eminent personality, Dr. Sonu Gandhi, ma'am, for this wonderful knowledge sharing program. Welcome you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Arti, for a <clears throat> uh, very long introduction. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, so I, I think uh, you can hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so uh, as uh, Professor Supa uh, introduced about the role of uh, women in science uh, and relate uh, it to the Nobel laureates also. So yeah, the life of a woman in science is very difficult and full of challenges in uh, everyday life, everyday scenario, but we have to take this challenge up and move um, uh, on with all these challenges and uh, yes, with a smile always. So with this, I uh, will share the work which uh, we are doing in the lab. It's a part of the research work that I will share it today. Uh, so uh, the main focus of the today's uh, talk is to uh, give benefit to the students who are listening here. And if there is any opportunity or interest to any student, then they are always welcome to join the lab for the research. So uh, my talk will be on the point of care diagnostics, which uh, can be used as, as the platform for rapid detection of diseases. Next slide is not moving. So first I would like to uh, give the overview of the lab uh, that we in the lab synthesize the biomolecules and uh, do the modifications of the small molecules like haptans. Haptans are very, very small, like in few deltans. So this cannot develop the antibodies itself. So we do the chemical modification of the groups and uh, uh, for the generation of antibodies in the animal models. <clears throat> the next is the, uh, we also work in the nucleic acid-based assays uh, by using the particles, uh, gold nanoparticles or any other nanomaterial that I will describe later on. And then we are we have started to work on the CRISPR-based assays also. Then uh, our next expertise is the antibody generation and the immunoassay development. In immunoassay development, we work from the lateral flow or the FET-based devices or SPR-based sensors or microfluidics. So uh, many different kinds of electrochemical sensors. So various different kinds of sensors we are working on. So another uh, small area we are venturing into is the targeting and drug delivery. So where, where we have started uh, by using the nanomaterials and that also I will describe in a short in, in the last slide. So what is biosensor and how it works? Basically, you can see this is the transducer surface. So this transducer surface is uh, can be any kind which we would like to develop a type of biosensor. It could be optical, QCM based, or the electrochemical. And then the binding of the receptors or the biomolecules uh, plays a, an important role after binding with the analytes. The analytes could be of anything like antigens uh, or the polytens or the chemicals or the DNA molecules. So these are the, the there is a lock and key kind of hypothesis there we use here. So these two binds together and then the signal transduce on the transducer surface and then it is connected with the amplifier and the signal processes in the form of a spectra that we got on the screen or the readings that we got on the screen. So uh, the in short, how we started with the happens. Uh, so this is the, the structure of a certain molecule that uh, we have modified in the lab. So this work I have done with Dr. Nishima, uh, who will give the talk. So we both are, uh, we both work during our uh, PhD uh, in MTech. So she is my senior. So I'm very, really very happy that we both are giving a uh, talk here. So 
Uh, so ma'am helped me in this. So uh, this is the structure of the uh, narcotic drug. So here the hydroxyl group was uh, modified uh, to the acidic group and we can the carrier molecule which is the BSA because of uh, BSA lysine groups are present so amino groups were used to link with the carboxylic group of the heptyl. So this is the kind of carbodiamide linkage that happened so we prepared different molar ratio of the molecule and then check with the gel electrophoresis. You can see from A to F, there is a shift in the, uh, the uh, peaks uh, or the bands. Uh, as the molecular weight increases, there is an increase in the shift. So then uh, we have done the fluorescence spectra because uh, the more the, the molecules, the more will be the quenching. So the more will be the quenching, the spectra will go down. So the top peak is of the BSA and the lowest peak is of the highest molecular weight, the more number of molecules to the carrier protein. The same we characterized with the Maldives uh, mass spectroscopy to know the number of molecules. Then we used this molecule to raise the antibody in rabbit, collected the blood, purified the antibodies, uh, and we developed the assays by using these antibodies. So uh, this is the kind of uh, graph that you can see. This is the first, boost, uh, first dose of the uh, molecule. This, this is the second dose. And uh, this is the third dose. Uh, so you can see in each dose in the white graph, the titer is increasing. Uh, so uh, after that, we uh, develop the competitive inhibition assay where we come to know about the limit of detection and the inhibitory concentration of the particular uh, molecules. And here we have developed different kinds of ELISA. FIA stands for the fluorescence immunoassays and ELISA is for the enzyme immunobased assays. So fluorescence-based assays is more sensitive than the enzyme-based assays. So uh, we uh, did both to compare the sensitivity and we can see the sensitivity in case of fluorescence is 10 times more than the enzyme-based assays. So uh, the next work is the synthesis of nanomaterials. We synthesize different nanomaterials in the lab from gold, uh, gold nanorods, or the graphene, or nanofibers, quantum dots, silver nanoparticles, iron oxide. Then, so uh, uh, with this, uh, this work we have done in collaboration with NTU Singapore. So here we have uh, developed the PDMS-based device. This device looks like that, source and drain uh, uh, gates were created and the <clears throat> gate voltage was applied and here in the middle, here in the middle the CNT was deposited uh, so and then the antibodies were bound onto it. I'll explain uh, what were the schemes. We have used three different schemes in this case. So you can see the carbon nanotube because it is very electroactive. So in electrochemical sensors we have to use electroactive nanomaterials. So we have used CNTs here. And in the first instance, what we have done, we have used the, in the A, we have used the antibodies and later we uh, flowed it with the different concentration of antigen, but we did not find much changes because the distance between the antibodies, uh, from, of the antibodies from the surface was uh, more as compared to the antigen. So we reversed the chemist uh, approach in this case. We used the conjugate on the CNTs in the B scheme and then we used the antibodies. Further, to enhance the sensitivity of the assay, we use the gold nanoparticles labeled antibodies. And here, what we have done, the characterization before processing of uh, it, that we have used the PDMS device and CNTs were transfer printed onto it. And then the, the uh, BSA molecule was uh, uh, applied. And then we looked at uh, if there is any change in the height uh, in the AFM. Then, after this, uh, we have done uh, the fluorescence and the, um, the CD spectroscopy of the different uh, concentration of the CNTs versus the BSA. <clears throat> and some in silico studies were also done to, uh, to observe whether there is any change in the conformation of the CNT before and after binding with the uh, uh, carboxylated or the uh, native, which is pristine CNTs. Uh, with BSA uh, or uh, uh, without BSA. So uh, this is the normal uh, few steps how we transfer printed. So on both pads, uh, PDMS 
surface we uh, put the CNTs and transfer printed and then the uh, source drain uh, gates were created and this is how the device will look like and these are the approaches which I told you first is antibodies then uh, we change the parameters and the uh, gold label antibodies with this we were able to achieve around uh, 100 femtograms uh, per ml of the sensitivity <coughs> then uh, what we have done we have also uh, used the IgY based antibodies because uh, as compared to IgG antibodies, IgY antibodies are easy to isolate and it is non-invasive. We have to just give the uh, in, uh, injections to the chicken and then we can collect the uh, eggs and collect the antibodies from the egg yolk. And the antibodies, IgY antibodies are more stable than the IgG antibodies due to the presence of extra CH2 domain in it. So with this, we have developed the LFA lateral flow-based assay for the detection of these uh, morphine. And we have done two characterization where the antibodies were labeled with the gold nanoparticles. So we have done some UV and tan based uh, characterization. And the limit of detection in this case was around 10 nanograms per ml. Uh, later on, we have done the patch display-based library also where we have um, what we have done in this uh, phage display of bacteriophages we, uh, were used and the libraries uh, uh, on the surface of phages there is the expression of the proteins which is single chain fragment variable proteins which is not a complete IgY, uh, IgG structure which is like uh, heavy and light chain. So in this uh, only variable he heavy and variable light chains are connected together. <clears throat> so that is another non-invasive process uh, if, uh, if there is a, uh, someone wants to escape the animal model studies. So what we have done, we have amplified the phages and the screening and sequencing of the bound phages with the, the molecule of interest was done. And we have done the several rounds of panning and selected the clones out of it which were above certain range and after that we have done the uh, gel and the sequencing of that and then uh, from that we have selected two clones and the clones were again uh, uh, labeled with the particles and characterized by the uh, transmission electron microscope. This is before and after uh, conjugation and you can see there is a shift in the UV spectra and the DLS spectra and the LFA based assay was were developed for that. The limit of detection was uh, more or less similar. The, 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 the beauty of this assay is that as compared to the polyclonal antibodies, uh, these single chain fragment SCFV antibodies recognize the drugs uh, with more specifically. You can see in this case, it is recognizing only two drugs, monocetal morphine and morphine, not the heroin and codeine because it is a clone. And the polyclonal antibodies were recognizing all the four closely related structures with the same specificity. So uh, this uh, also can be optimized by this uh, using the SCFVs. Then we have developed the uh, FAT-based sensor, which is the field effect transistors. Uh, so for this, we have used the three molecules, which for HIV, uh, CTN1 is a marker of uh, cardiac. <clears throat> cardiac marker and uh, RA is the rheumatoid arthritis uh, marker. The, so what we have done in this case, we have used uh, exfoliate the uh, 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 substrate and uh, with the ED lithography and thermal evaporation and we have created the source and, source and drain uh, electrodes and then uh, the antibodies were uh, activated by using the carbodimide chemistry and antigens were floated on it and uh, the change in the resistance was recorded or in the real time manner. This work we have done in collaboration with IC Bangalore. So the, all the device characteristics were, uh, uh, were done before uh, doing the analytical performance of the device. So you can see before uh, and after uh, uh, treatment, the device were uh, analyzed uh, and the resistance were measured. And we have also checked the, whether the response is coming from the graphene or from the gold. So in the case of uh, gold electrode, there is, there is no response. We got this straight line. And the stability of the device was evaluated for four weeks and the device was very robust. <clears throat> then we have done the SAM analysis and uh, of optical 
uh, microscope the normal uh, imaging to see the structure of the graphene uh, and we have done the SAM analysis uh, where the graphene and antibody mobilized graphene were evaluated and the analytical performance of the uh, FET was uh, uh, done. The limit of detection in case of HIV in this case was 10 femtograms and uh, CTN1 was around 100 and <clears throat> uh, RA was around 10 femtograms per annum. Then uh, for JEV, uh, we have uh, what we have done, we have done the cloning of a, 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 for a non structural gene in the JEV because JEV is, uh, is a very important disease because in India every year in uh, Northeast area or the uh, Bihar area, there is an outbreak occurs of the Japanese encephalitis virus uh, because of the uh, bite of the Culex mosquito. So uh, for this, the diagnosis is uh, some, most of the time is it is confused uh, or the doctor says it is deng dengue. So uh, because these are uh, the, the JEV and the dengue has a closely related genes. Uh, so uh, for this, we uh, we developed the diagnostic assay. For this, we have cloned the gene expressed and uh, then we have immunized uh, the rabbits and raised the antibodies for it. And uh, the, the clone, the recombinant protein was expressed successfully and we have developed the fat-based sensors again for this. And the ELISA were developed before uh, developing the fat-based sensors. The limit uh, in this case was around 0.25 micrograms per ml by ELISA. And these are the characterization data uh, uh, like UV and uh, FTIR, Raman and SAM uh, at each step. And the real-time sensing of uh, the fat-based sensors gave us around in femtomolar concentration, which is very quick and we require very few microliters, just one or two microliters of the sample. So with this, what uh, this is urokinase plasminogen, another study. Uh, this is the biomarker. UPAR is a biomarker of a cancer. So cancer is also sometimes diagnosed, uh, most of the time is diagnosed at uh, middle or the late stage. So uh, it is very important uh, to diagnose this uh, disease at early stage. So for this, we have uh, uh, came up to the uh, one uh, sensing approach where we have used the uh, another electrode, uh, the FTO. Uh, so the FTO was uh, fabricated with the uh, graphene nanosheets um, and it is functionalized with the carbodamide chemistry and the antibodies were uh, bound onto its surface and antigens were added. So these are the few characterizations that uh, we always do before the uh, analytical performance of the device. So these are the UV and DLS and FTIR and SAM images of each step that we do to uh, make sure that uh, whatever we are doing uh, is uh, happening. So these are the sum of the <clears throat> cyclic voltammetric and the differential pulse voltammetric responses of each step. Uh, and uh, we measure the current in this case. So uh, this I will describe to uh, you uh, that what we have done, we have used the different concentration of antibody to know the optimum concentration, then the scan rate, temperature, pH, all these parameters were uh, calibrated before doing the analysis, then the analytical performance at, of different uh, concentration of antigens. These are the same CV and BTV graph uh, of the same. Then uh, we have uh, checked the cross-reactivity, whether these are recognizing the specific, the specific antigen or the non-specific. So uh, it was able to recognize 10 femtomolar of UPAR antigen in this case, and the electrode was quite a stable up to three weeks. So uh, another area is the electrochemical detection of the pesticides, um, uh, which we are doing. This is uh, quite... Uh, old uh, data, but uh, uh, we are doing some other pesticides also in the lab. So that I will uh, maybe in uh, if given opportunity, I will share in the in another talk. So this is the atrazine, which is very widely used pesticide in India. Uh, so uh, what we uh, have done in this case, this work was done in collaboration uh, with uh, Chicago uh, Northwestern University. So here we used the cantilever, gold-coated cantilever, where antibodies were immobilized. Uh, 
by using the chemical SATA. This SATA, what uh, it has done to it, it attach the uh, sulfhydryl group to the antibody, which bind very nicely with the gold uh, because gold is inert and nothing can bound to it until it is treated with some chemical uh, moieties. So with this uh, one PPT of atrazine was uh, detected. Another work we, which we have done is for the detection of the uh, chlorpyrifos by using the ATP based sensors. And uh, this is the 2,4-D pesticide which we have done by using the PDMS based device with 50 picomolar of uh, detection limit. And this is another chlorpyrifos based sensor uh, where we have used the FPO. So another work is the aflatoxins, mycotoxins detection because uh, in the dairy uh, uh, sector, the cows or um, the buffaloes are the um, uh, main source which provide milk to us. So what happens when the feed is given to them, sometimes, most of the time or sometimes it is contaminated with the mycotoxins. So once they eat, uh, when, once they eat, it reaches to their gut and then what happens, these mycotoxins then secrete into the milk also, which we consume as a and a user. So it is very important to detect and uh, because it is a one help, uh, humans and animals both are important. So uh, what we have done, very, we developed a very quick gold nanoparticle based aggregation based assays. We have used uh, gold nanoparticles and simple aptamers. Aptamers are the, the sequences of the nucleic acids. So these aptamers, if we design specifically, it can bind to the target molecule and then on the basis of change in the color, we can say yes or no in the tube also, or else we can develop the microfluidic device, which is very simple to develop by using the papers. So what we have done, uh, we have used the salt in this case. So once the aptamer bound onto the gold surface by phase absorption, then when we add the salt, there's no aggregation occurs. Once you, we add the specific molecule to it, it, it displays and, and these specific uh, uh, aptamers bind to the specific molecules and hence due to the presence of salt, there is aggregation or change in the color, which is blue happened. So we can say, yes, the molecule is there. So there is a gradation in the color also that we can calibrate uh, with the standard concentration to know uh, how much uh, flotoxin uh, is present. And for each uh, uh, mycotoxin like okra toxins, different types of okra toxins, uh, aflatoxin M1, B1, or any other type we can develop with this the aptamers. So with this, we have done the several studies uh, based upon the different concentration of aptamers, different concentration of salt. And then after that, we fabricated the microfluidic device where you can see, uh, you can see there is the control zone and the, this is the detection zone and this is the sample zone. So where we have added uh, the milk without aflatoxin, here we have added milk with aflatoxin. So here you can see in the presence of aflatoxin, the, the color changes to blue, while in the absence of aflatoxin, there is no change in the color. So this another study is that, uh, this is for again for cancer. What we have developed is the activatable nanosensor. So what we have used, uh, we have used this specific peptide so these peptides uh, in the cancer, uh, uh, there is the, the proteus uh, sites that are specific in each cancer types. So uh, like matrix metalloproteases, these are specific, uh, there is a specific cleavage site for MMPs. So what we have done, we have inserted this protease recognition site in the middle of this peptide. You can see here, and then there is a N and C terminal where we have labeled it with the biotin. Uh, the second uh, step is that we synthesize the iron oxide nanoparticles and we have labeled these iron oxide nanoparticles with the lactic, uh, with the uh, streptavidin. We know that the, there is a strong binding happened between the streptavidin and biotin. So what happened once when we add these, this peptide to uh, the nanoparticle coated with the streptavidin, there is an aggregation occurs and the instrument, which is known as the MPS, magnetic particle spectrometer. So when we see with the naked eye or with the instrument, the signal intensity goes down due to aggregation. Once we add the cells uh, expressing the proteases, MMP or the gastric cancer or any breast cancer types. So 
due to the cleavage of this peptide in the middle, because the protease recognition site is there, there is the dispersion of the molecules at first. So then, because of this, the MPS signal goes up. So this is the very, uh, very quick test uh, to diagnose whether the, 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 which protease type is there, whether the cancer is over, uh, markers are overexpressing or not. So this is the one kind of study we have done. Then this is another study for brain cancer, uh, the particles, iron oxide particles were synthesized and labeled with the lactoferrin. We know that there is a lactoferrin uh, uh, transferrin receptors present in the brain. So uh, otherwise it is very difficult to cross the blood brain barrier. And these transferrin receptors bind very, very specifically with the lactoferrin. So these lactoferrins were labeled onto the uh, iron oxide particles and the, all the characterization stability and the signal intensity were analyzed over the period of one week, one month. And after that, uh, some in, in vitro imaging uh, was done by using the uh, cell lines, C6 cell lines, and you can see in the lactoferrin coated particles, there was more uptake is, as compared to the control or the only particles. So, And your voice is not audible. Yes, it's very low. So after uh, 24 and uh, after 12 and 24 hours, there was the uptake in case of lactoferrin coated particles. Can you hear now? Yes, yes. Now it's clear, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so this is the last uh, slide I'm showing. Uh, this is for the UPAR, uh, UPAR based uh, uh, targeting. So what we have done, as, a, as I told you, in the over in the cancer metastasis, there is the overexpression of the uh, biomarkers occurs. So UPAR is one of that, a urokinase plasminogen activator receptor, which expressed in all different kinds of cancer, and it is highly, highly overexpressed. So we targeted this receptor. This receptor is having three domains, and it has GPI linker. It does not cross the membrane. So I am not going in the mechanism of this receptor, how it interacts, how the signaling occurs, just telling the brief of the study. So what we have done, we have synthesized the particles here and functionalized it with the polymer and labeled it with the peptide. This peptide is linked with the FITC. So you can see whether the, the targeting is occurring inside or uh, on the surface of the cell only. So you can see this part in the, in the imaging, the particles are entering inside the cell and the blue is the DAPI uh, of the nucleus. So we have done before that some in silico studies that exactly where the peptide is binding there are two peptides responsible for this. One is GFD and another is SMD. So we uh, designed the sequences and labeled it and uh, then checked with the in silico. Then uh, we have done some uh, characterization of the uh, peptides. So uh, different combinations with the UV, DLS and uh, TAM uh, and the zeta potential. Then what we have done, we have checked the in vitro fluorescence intensity of the peptides. Uh, uh, inside and outside in the supernatant as well as inside the cell, whether it is decreasing or increasing. So we find that the combination of these two peptides, DFB and SMB, helped in the uh, efficient targeting of this receptor. Uh, and this is the cell adhesion-based assay where we, uh, we plated the cells and then we added the, the different uh, combinations that we have tested. So we have find out that the GFD and SME, you can see <clears throat> in the blue graph, it is almost flattened. There is most uptake occurs in the GFD plus SMB and then the GFD. While in the case of the uh, pep alone peptide, which is SMB or the particles or the, with the particles with the polymer, there is uh, more or less no uptake. So then this is the imaging experiments that we have done. So like the maximum imaging and the facts aspect uh, of the same where we find out the maximum uh, uptake in the case of GFD and the SMB and then the GFD. So with this, I would like to thank uh, 
Association of uh, Chemistry Teachers uh, and Professor Helen for inviting me for the talk and uh, I thank uh, INEAS for nominating me and uh, all uh, DBT, DST, Indian Academy of Sciences, DBT, my uh, students, everyone to help me to conduct this research. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for giving such a elaborative, uh, beautiful representation of the role of nanoparticles, uh, how we and the how we can use the biosensors, their fabrication part, and the principle of biosensors. You really made the session very interesting. Even I'm very keen to learn now about biosensors, how to apply them. So thank you so much for giving such a wide preview of how we can detect uh, certain very uh, contagious diseases with the help of biosensors. And even that was very important, the role of aflatoxin uh, detection that you told in MIL. That is very much needed. And I think the entire mankind should have such type of knowledge. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So now it's time uh, to introduce our next uh, resource person. So before that, uh, I should say that teachers can change lives with the right mix of chalk and challenges. And with this, I would like to introduce my diligent speaker, Dr. Lena Francis, a renowned principal uh, at uh, Indian School, Alsi Muscat. And I would like to give a brief uh, uh, review of her profile, although it is very wide, but I'll just brief it out. And uh, she is a PhD in management, a very passionate learner with a motto of serving leadership, a recipient of many awards for her meritorious services rendered to the students of Indian School in Oman in 2011 by Indian School Club, Muscat. She has got a certificate of appreciation by the Ministry of Education for the efforts and contribution to the high achievement of students in trends in mathematics and science for grade eight science also felicitated with a certificate of appreciation by the Ministry of Education for presentation of performance appraisal of teachers. So a well-rounded, renowned educator is here with us on this platform. I welcome you, ma'am, for your address. Over to you, Lina, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Lina, can you hear me? Alina, ma'am? Yes. Um, am I audible? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah please, please. Do it. All right. Thank you very much for that uh, very, very motivating words. Today is Guru Paurami. It's a day which should be dedicated for the teachers. So I would like to dedicate this presentation uh, to my mom. She is, she was, and she is, uh, she was, and she is a teacher always. And my father, and uh, all my dedicated teachers uh, who have made me in this platform and the ones whom, with whom I am working. A very, very happy evening to you all. I would like to thank uh, my gratitude uh, to be expressing to Professor Bridges, President ACT, and Professor uh, D.V. Prabhu, General Secretary of ACT, and then SRM University the officials uh, for this unique opportunity to to throw some light on the successful women in science. Last presentation, you have been hearing about the complex atomic structure and the processes of chemistry. And uh, I am going to take up the storytelling mode. I hope all of you will enjoy this. In 2021, the science world is commemorating 125 years of one of the most well-known accident, accidental discoveries in physics and chemistry. On an overcast day in March 1896, French physicist Henri Becquerel opened a drawer and discovered spontaneous radiations. But it was Madame Curie, the mother of modern physics, a pioneering researcher on radioactivity, who discovered two new elements, that is namely polonium and radium, and whose revolutionary findings about the atom had widespread applications throughout the 20th century especially in the field of medicine, a savior of, from the deadly disease cancer. On the screen, you can see radium and the pigment ore, Madame Curie, and then of course, um, polonium. Here, I have taken the pictures from the 
a biography of Madame Curie, which was written by her second daughter, that is Eve Curie. The life and, le and legacy of a legendary scientist, Maria Salomia Skrodowska, the first woman to receive a doctorate in France, the first woman professor at Scorbon University, the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, the first person and the only woman to win two Nobel Prizes, the only person to win them in two different scientific fields, that is physics in 1903 and uh, chemistry in 1911. As science teachers, I'm sure all of us are always curious to know about the scientist stories. Today, the webinar by WINS, that is Women in Science. Let me share the real life story of Madame Curie, who had an ardent love for science, high intelligence, strong conviction that her work would provide important benefits for humanity and the ability to persevere in the light of difficulties what she faced. You can see here the images of the Nobel Prizes what she won in 1903 and then 1911, both for physics and chemistry. Let us see how was her childhood. That is, uh, she was born on November 7th, 1867. Her father was a professor of mathematics and physics. Her mom, mom was a pianist, pianist, uh, uh, pianist, singer, and then a teacher. Both of them belonging to impoverished minor nobility uh, in Poland, which was under the oppressive rule of the Russian Tsars. The catastrophes stuck that family one after the other. Mania had a very sad childhood days as her elder sister, Sophie, died of typhus and her mom succumbed to tuberculosis after a long illness. When Mania was, a little Mania was just 11 years, she lost her mom. Her father was demoted and his salary was reduced since he was not surveilled enough towards the Russian bosses. Thus, the, the once the happy and the contented household uh, was reduced to family with a father without much income to look after his three daughters and a son. Despite these hardships, Mania finished her secondary education with gold medal, emulating her siblings, Joseph and Dronia. All the children were too good in studies. Mary, who had been fascinated since her childhood by the physics apparatus that her father had kept in the house, wanted to study physics and mathematics always. You can see here little Mary and then Bronia. Unfortunately, at that time, the Polish university did not admit girls. And then the only option available to those who wanted to study was to go to other places like Europe, in, principally in Paris. As Bronia and Mania could not find as much needed financial support, Mania uh, hit upon a brilliant idea that was an act of supreme uh, sacrifice, I should say. She would take up the job of the governess and Bronia would go to Paris and enroll herself in the medical school and would receive support from her father and Mania. When Bronia finishes her studies she, and starts practicing and she will support Mania in Paris, this was a plan. Long seven years, our Mania, Maria, they shared lots of pet names, in fact. Uh, Mania worked as a governess, had been away from studies, though she had gamely tried to keep in touch with the mathematics and science. Luckily, she also got opportunities for working in a makeshift laboratory, which rekindled her desire, and she left for Paris in late 1891 and enrolled in Sorbonne University as Mary Skrodowska by receiving the invitation of her sister, Dr. Bronia. By the time she became already a doctor. So I'm trying to, to depict here the various roles of various phases what our Mary, Madame Curie, have uh, gone through. As a student, with a single-minded devotion, she pursued her studies while leading a very difficult life on 40 rubles a month. She graduated in physics, stopping her class and returned to Poland. But she was awarded the Aleksandrovich scholarship, which allowed her to go back to Skorbon. And then in 1894, she took second honors in mathematics. This is the university where she was studying. Next as a wife. Most important event during her second stay in Paris was her meeting with Pierre Curie. 
attracted to his young lady who matched with his devotion to science, Peary fell in love with Mary. But she took her own time in reciprocating it, as that would involve not returning to Poland after her studies, as she had planned and promised to herself. She had an ardent love towards her native place, that is Poland. She always wanted to go and settle there. Finally, science and theory won, and they were married, started the association and the discussion about radioactivity. As a female scientist, she had to fight for even the most rudimentary lab, basic laboratory space and face down those who stood in her way. I'm showing in between a few pictures which I have taken from the biography um, of Madame Curie, which was given by Eve. You can see here, they both are standing in front of their house. Fortunately, Piri Curie, who shared her passions and fought along with her for scientific justice, husband and wife team as they conducted painstaking experiments in their underfunded labs and enduring back breaking labor to shovel, crush and boil the tons of wheat plant or to measure signs of radioactivity hidden within. Mary was very sure that pit blunt ore has not only uranium, its crap will have some more radioactive substances. So then she, they both continued their pursuit for hunting in this in tons and tons of this pit blunt ore. The storeroom at Peary School was too small. You can see some of the pictures of that. Too small for such work. And curious continued their work in an abandoned shed nearby uh, to their house for long four years. Mary Curie and her husband, Pierre, came together through a shared love of science and research. They spent their marriage working side by side, sharing groundbreaking scientific discoveries, even Nobel Prize. 1903, they were sharing the Nobel Prize. You can see some of the pics of Madame Curie and Pierre Curie at their lab. I'm sure all of us, you know, about radioactivity. I'm not telling much about that. It's just a basic thing. Here, you can see the, the uh, writings of Piri Curie and then the work, what they have been doing together. The, it, it was just a shed, an attic, wherein they both were working together for long four years, looking for uh, a new element, which is more radioactive, which, is, which has got more radiation than that of uranium. It was just Mary's intuition that there is something new, which is in this with blunt ore. Then they went on. Yes, many instances we experience. This is the uh, radioactive discovery of that. And now coming to, I just would, I would like to speak, uh, speak about the instances we experience as gender biases in our workplace in professional life. Madame Curie was also not an exception. She was not included in the first list for the Nobel Prize in 1903. Fortunately, Piri got the advance notice of the commendation and then instead that Mary share in the honor as well. He told, I told them that if there is a Nobel Prize to be won, we will win it together. Piri informed these officials. Their bond was so strong and Piri was a pillar of support for Madame Curie's achievements. She used to tell her, you did the extraordinary. You changed the world. You are going to change the world. And uh, definitely he always was feeling so happy that he got a wife made expressly for him to share all his preoccupations. At this point of time, I would like to say, uh, at this point of time, I would like to say that when I also went through my studies, doing the job and studies together, it was never an easy task. But my husband, Franci, he stood with me. He was my source of um, encouragement and energy, especially my, during my PhD studies. It took so, almost four years, four and a half years. And uh, I, I just could not spend uh, any of the holy days with him. I will be always with him, uh, finding a literature review or something, or the, you know, the various process along with it. So then uh, here, when I was going through it, yes, uh, if I am here with Dr. Lena, one of the main major sources is my husband. Now, moving on to a very tragic, uh, tragic event what had happened. On April 19, 1906, after the tragic death of Peary, who was uh, trampled by a horse wagon, she lost her um, stoicism. 
privately breaking down in heart-wrenching sobs of despair. They could live only eight years together. Pierre had lost his um, life um, just on the spot. It was a very, very tragic incident. Life after she was widowed became very harsh for Mary with an old man of 79 years, that is uh, Pierre's father, uh, Dr. Curie, and the two children at the age of two years and nine years, two girls. She has to take care of these two children and uh, her father. Despite her shock and grief, Mary went back to work a day after the funeral of Pierre Curie. Less than a month later, the Scorbon agreed to make her its first woman professor, taking up Pierre's position. She decided to establish a scientific institution worthy of Pierre's memory. And definitely her friends helped her and then she never remarried. She devoted her life to the Radium Institute as they dreamt together, both husband and wife. Dear teachers, dear listeners, Mary was an embodiment of courage, self-determination, admirable discipline for her set goals. Let me speak about her as a mother. She was by all accounts relentlessly driven by her research, yet raised to outstanding children. She used to find quality time for her girls, concentrated on building novel values for her, practice collective teaching for them. She used to fetch different kinds of teachers, whichever, whichever way the, ch the children wanted. And she was not just a professor, crushed under her, the, her daily task, but an illustrious woman. You can see here, the both children here and then, Irene and Eve, both were Nobel Prize winners. Peary's work was continued by their daughter and son-in-law, that is Irene Curie and uh, uh, Frederick Juliet. You can see in this picture, the, the picture I'm sure you are all seeing that, and won the Nobel Prize for chemistry in 1935. Of course, Mary was not lucky enough to see that. The Nobel Prize was to cross the family again. Eve married the American diplomat and both took keen interest in social problems. And as director of UN Children's Fund, her husband received on behalf of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1965. They're all Nobel Prize laureates. As a scientist, the French academic community did not take kindly to the Polish girl. Despite great discoveries and winning honors, many had come up with the theory that radium was not an element, but a compound of the non-elements lead and helium. It took her several years to prove beyond doubt that radium was indeed an element. She was, she was so close to that. Even while they are naming it the first element, Piri was asking her what name to give. She said, can we give polonium? About, uh, thinking about her, her, her native land that is Poland. The next they have given the name as Radium. Here you can see, uh, she's, she was the only woman who, has, who was there for the conference. The picture depicts that. You can see all the very, very famous uh, physicists and chemists of that era, and she's, she was the only woman among them. Mary Curie's single-minded devotion to science, which did not waver either in the face of the adversities or in the face of wealth which accompanied the Nobel Prizes, or while spurring the, the fortune which could have been theirs if they had patented the extraction of radium. Mary and Pierre Curie could have patented the process of extraction of radium, which was a fruit for the four long years of hard work in an attic. And then they could definitely do it. Piri explained the situation and uh, asked Mary, what should we do? She, her reply was a very firm reply. It is impossible. It would be contrary to the scientific spirit. Nothing could lure Mary away from the path of science. She said that radium is an element. It is not ours. It is for the world, science world. I, I, I'm showing in between a few quotations by Mary, Madame Curie, which uh, I, I was truly amazed and then attracted. She, had, she has got a clear perseverance and above all confidence in ourselves. We must believe that we are gifted for something and that is, that is this thing must be attained. She was very clear in her beliefs and she stood with it. 
Yes. As a human lover, before I get into war, when she became a widow, she had to decide on the attribution to the gram of radium. And again, that one gram radium, what they extracted, it was theirs. But then she wanted to donate even that one gram radium to the Radium Institute. By that time, the value of that one gram radium was more than a million gold francs. In her mind, it was inconvenient to be poor. It was superfluous and shocking to be external rich also. So she never wanted to grab money by owning it or by keeping it. She donated that one gram radium to the Institute. Even the Nobel Prize money received was spent not for personal properties, but for gifts to Polish students, to a childhood friend of Mary, and for the improvement of labs and the laboratory laborers who were us in need of money. Next comes to the war during the First World War, that is 1914 to 18. She created the first radiological cars. They were nicknamed as Little Cuties by fixing the Rontgen X-ray apparatus and a dynamo circulated from hospital to hospital. Madame Curie was an exciting and an authoritative personage. Aside from the 24 cars, she also installed 220 radiological rooms. Mary poss possessed in the highest degree that humble, precious gift of getting on with, with anything. She imposed systematic training on either perfecting her techniques with X-ray apparatus, reading the anatomical treatment to get the culture of a perfect medical radiologist, passing even her driving license for moving from one place to another when this first world war was happening and initiating herself to medicines. She was basically into chemistry and physics, but for the sake of treating these people who are, uh, who are hurt and wound, she also got into medicine. She studied how to operate this the Rongen, um, the X-ray apparatus. You can see some of the pics of that. She wanted to avoid something she hated, calling someone for help. She never wanted anybody to be, someone to be called for help. So she even took license at that age. And then she used to move from one place to another in her, this little Curie cars. She was never happy for fame or name as I was indicating, and always pleaded to keep her away from the interviews and then celebrations. Such a trivial manifestations of vanity had always annoyed her. She agreed to visit the US only if she could be donated a gram of radium for her radium institute. Then Madame Melona, one of the uh, US um, person had asked her, requested her, she has been waiting to see Madame Curie for of some 24 years, and then she had an ardent love towards her. So then she said, can you, can you visit US? She said, I will visit US only if you can give me one gram of radium. It is too high for me. It is too, too, I am too, too poor to buy that. So if you can den donate that, because by the time its value has become almost a million US dollars. They have told, then she was told that if you can give me, then I shall come. Yes, they agreed. They have gone for a campaign and they could gather that money. And then here you can see her visit in the US president to us donating that one gram gold. She also made sure that that, that one gram radium, radium, what has gone to, what has come to her, it is not to her daughters. It will be going to the Radium Institute. That, that kind of, that was her behavior. As a, a teacher, she loved being with students giving her energy and an efforts to her people. To the future scientist, of course, Mary had an amazing power of intuition, teaching the complex concepts of physics and chemistry in a very, sim very simple mode. As she predicted, radioactivity turned out to be a fundamental property of every atom of matter. It was her prediction. It came true. The astounding impact of Curie's transformative work has an impeccable output in the history of the world, in the field of medicine, nuclear reactions and defense. You know the story, that's what had happened. At this juncture, I'm, I'm reminded of um, me as a teacher. In 2004, uh, when we were doing radioactivity study, some lessons on this, 
Um, my students were asking, we were talking about the cancer treatment and chemotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. They were just asking, ma'am, can we, how, where, how can we see it? Have you ever seen? Of course, I also didn't see. And we took a permission from one of the very famous hospitals over here and then their oncology department. So everybody, my colleagues are, are definitely discouraged me telling that you know, it's not going to happen. Nobody is going to show that oncology department. It's abandoned from, for normal people. I said, no, let, let, let's no harm in trying. I tried, I, I knocked all the doors possible. And uh, two of my students and myself, we three um, set and then we could, could, could see, we could talk to that, um, that radiologist, the, the head of the, uh, the department oncology. And then we could see the various uh, kinds of uh, the chemotherapy, their explanations, and then uh, the new needles what they're using and how how protective they're keeping it in the lead so that radiation will not come out in everything almost a day we could spend over there which i always uh, uh, remember and the children one of them has taken physics as their main and then she is pursuing for phd now in physics um just to just to cherish my memory yes moving on to uh, the this is the uh, the radium institute what she has developed she was the the uh, in the complete uh, um, architect i can say of that lay. Yes, uh, now every uh, good thing has to have an end. And then here, mother of modern physics. Um, it, it, she, uh, in her time, Madame Curie saw both positive and negative health impacts as radiation, including its ability to shrink tumors. She too falls prey to radiation related ailments, and she was exposed for 35 long years, leading to her death at the age of 66 on July 4th, 1934 from plastic um, uh, anemia, a blood disease likely to do to the exposure of large amounts of radiation over, uh, over her lifetime. So she left the world at the age of 66. In 1995, the, uh, the remains of, you can see the, the press report of her and her tomb also I have just um, captured and kept here as the PowerPoint presentation. Without tears, we won't be able to finish reading that book also. She knew that she'll be affected, but she continued her pursuit. In 1995, she, the, the remains of the pair were transferred to the Majestic uh, Museum in, in, in Paris, where they now they lay alongside. You can see here, Pierre Curie and Marie Curie uh, in the greatest citizens. The president of France declared that the transfer demonstrated the nation's respect for the Curies who dedicate themselves to science. So now they are there. And I was fortunate enough to visit that museum in 2007 and touch her tomb, both of them. Uh, it was my wish. And then um, I still remember that. When I am, I'll become very emotional when I speak about that moment when I touched that. And um, it was my secret wish then. I have kept my daughter name as Evelyn, of course, but short name is Eve. <laughs> yes. Now to conclude, Madame Curie, as a female scientist, it was interesting to see how she got challenged first and then respected in a male dominated world and opened doors for other female scientists down the line. Her phenomenal achievements opened the door to deep changes in the way scientists think about matter and then energy. As we all perform various roles as daughter, wife, mother, daughter-in-law, sister, sister-in-law, and of course, our professional life as teachers, we really tend to overwork and get stressed. My earnest request to all of you to kindly take care of your physical and then mental health. Give a compulsory me time every day, um, every day to you. Kindly be mindful. I too have faced innumerable challenges as a teacher, at the department, vice principal, and as a principal in my professional life. And I have a simple motto. When the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Simple as it is. A few more uh, uh, quotations. I am, I am just getting into the, my, the, the last slides. So we must continue to upskill the way the challenges of our provision. De definitely we should be able to tackle. We should be up upskill, upskilling the, uh, to tackle the challenges. And we need women education leaders at all levels. Definitely we have to motivate ourselves. Then next one is, uh, the next point which I want to tell you is that as a female teacher and administrator, I have faced with certain obstacles and challenges, but often communication with the stakeholders and understanding on both ends helps to solve the problems always. Ultimately, 
we have to worry about, we have to think about the holistic development of the student, that is our aim. And of course, today being July 24th, when I'm starting my 29th year, year in the field of education, I have completed by the grace of God, by the, by the, the blessings of all, the, all my teachers and parents and all the well-wishers. Today, I have completed my 28th year. I'm sticking, stepping into the 29th year uh, in the education system. I advocate for women's leadership in scientific research and technology and to foster the capacity of the research centers in our home cent in our countries. We must ensure an attitude of scientific research among ourselves. In the alpha generation, let me just get you to the next slide. Here you can see, irrespective of the caste and creed and the color and race, every woman, every woman is, uh, is very, very challenging, important. They have got high amount of potential. So we must ensure an attitude of scientific research. And then definitely it will, be, uh, and we have to spread that to the alpha generation. And they have to continue this pursuit, not the rote learning, but uh, an attitude of research. And it could be in the various fields such as health, biomedicine, sustainable agriculture, food security, food security, water, energy, and climate change, and what not more. So dear listeners, you have been listening to me for last, um, say, uh, 25 to 30 minutes time. I'm so thankful for the opportunity what is given to me. When, when women come together, we rise faster, go further, and truly change the world. This is what my message. Everything is possible by everybody. This is what life has, life has taught me. And I'm sure all of you definitely will be moving towards this. With this, thank you very much. What a teacher writes on the blackboard of life can never be erased. Of course, nowadays we don't write on blackboard, but when the, what is the color of the board doesn't matter. What we speak, our students definitely will take you to their heart. That is what my experience is and we'll be always respected. With this, I wind off. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a motivational address of yours. And I think uh, you said that women all together, if they work together, and that, that is very much relevant. And I think that is very much being efficiently proved by this platform. And I really congratulate our convener, Dr. Kavita, who really laid this platform for women in science. Thank you so much for the magnificent uh, uh, biography, truthful biography that you produced about the, our radioactive scientist and the beautiful uh, gallery of her pictures that you showed from childhood till her uh, entire journey of life was really very wonderful. And I really appreciate the way uh, you imbibe the confidence in your student is really worth worthy to say that teachers like you are real model of the society. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. So now it's time to introduce our uh, eminent uh, resource person, Dr. Nishima Wangu. Before that, I would like to say better than thousand days of uh, diligent study is one day with a great teacher. And I think this platform is serving this same. So uh, I'll just give a uh, very shortly a sh brief review of uh, Dr. Nishima, who is uh, Assistant Professor in Department of Applied Science, UIET Punjab University. She's a PhD from Institute of Micro Microbial Technology, CSIR, and Punjab University, Chandigarh, published more than 45 international peer-reviewed uh, papers and many patents. Also, her research interest is basically based on biosensors, biosensing of contaminants using nanomaterials and peptides, development of antimicrobial conjugates of peptides and nanoparticles to combat multidrug resistance and many more. Her research uh, interest is very wide, so I just briefly mentioned it. A meritorious uh, recipient of several awards like Professor UC Panth Memorial Award, DST Inspire Faculty Award and many, and has completed almost more than seven projects sanctioned by DST SERP CSIR, DBT, DST, Inspire. I am really, we are really glad to have today Dr. Nishima Wangu here with us on this platform. I welcome you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for this very kind introduction. 
and I hope that my slides are visible and I'm audible properly so that I can begin. Yes, 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 ma'am. Yes, thank yes, you so audible. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, speakers who spoke before me, and I think they have covered much of the part. So I would just skip some of the slides which were overlapping, and I will continue with the ones that I can provide new information with. And uh, let's begin with the, my talk, which is titled Scientific and Societal Challenges Come Opportunities for Women Scientists. So in my talk, I would first focus upon what are the challenges for the women scientists, and then what even are the opportunities, because there is always a silver lining to a dark cloud. So which are the opportunities which we can harness out of the challenges that are there in front of a women scientist? And I would very briefly talk about my research work as well. Uh, I recently came across this report by DBT, which is the Department of uh, Biotechnology, where they had listed few women, Indian women in science. So this is the list and it was titled like this, if you can see women who broke the glass ceiling, women who left their mark, women who inspired. So there are so many women mentioned here, the scientists mentioned here. And uh, to my surprise, I was not knowing some, I didn't even hear about the names of some of the scientists. In, certainly I know some of these scientists, I have uh, learned about them, I have read about them, I have met some of them, but there are some which I didn't know. So that was a shock for me. And I thought we should definitely highlight the achievements of women scientists to a much greater extent than what they are currently. So uh, I would just uh, request you to focus on the first one, the woman who broke the glass ceiling. So these four scientists, Anandi Bai Joshi, Kandambani Ganguly, Janki Amal, Iravati Kari. So I will not go into the details of what they have achieved in their life, but just I will mention a few lines about them. Anandi Bai Joshi, she became a mother when she was only 14 years old and her baby died in 10 days due to lack of medical care and facilities. Now we can imagine what kind of a shock she must have got and this huge trauma, it triggered her desire to do something for the healthcare in India. Therefore, she graduated with the MD and then she uh, joined a hospital, but she died of tuberculosis even before she turned 22. So that was actually very sad that such, we lost such a great, with the first uh, doctor we can say. Then Kadambani Ganguly is a doctor who broke the myth. And she is special in her own way that not only she was a good scientist, brilliant scientist, a doctor, but she was also involved in the India's freedom struggle. And she became the first woman to be on the dais at a session of the Indian National Science Congress. And she also died on duty when she, uh, in 1923, after return from a house call when medical aid, it failed to reach her. Janki Amal, we have definitely, most of us have uh, heard about her. In fact, we have an award also named after her in the bioscience field. And every time we take sugar, Janki Amal lives in, on, in spirit because her research is what added that extra bit of sweetness to the sugar because she developed a sweeter variety of sugar cane. And Iravati Karve was an anthropologist. Now, again, I would like to stress on this title, Women Who Broke the Glass Ceiling. Please focus on this title. Uh, it is a good title that we have uh, chosen, the women who broke the glass ceiling. But are there any men who break the glass ceiling? The answer, of course, we will never say this, these men broke the glass ceiling. Why? Because there is no glass ceiling for them. There is no, there is only a glass in common. Now here starts the bias. This, the bias actually, so this is a kind, I will keep on focusing on the invisible bias that we have in our mind. So this is the first example of the invisible bias that we have in our mind that there, there exists a ceiling for a woman, be it a scientist or any other field, there exists a ceiling. Then there was very, uh, uh, this story of Kamla Sohani is very interesting. Uh, most of you must have heard, but for the students who must not have uh, heard about her, she had applied to the Indian Institute of Science for a research fellowship. And at that time, the director of Indian Institute of Science was Professor C.V. Raman. We all know who is Professor C.V. Raman. Surprisingly, despite being a person of such a huge caliber and uh, such a great person uh, Professor C.V. Raman was, she did, he did not consider women competitive enough to pursue uh, research. 
so he rejected the application of kamla sohani now she was a lady who, who who didn't used to talk much so what she did was she didn't take it in a good spirit so she uh, revolted in a gandhian style in a peaceful style she, she started revolting she sat outside the office and she insisted that i should get the admission because i i fulfill all the criteria and she was right now because she was right and she had all those qualifications so eventually professor raman had to agree but he put some clauses for her admission now what were the clauses please see them he said that he will be on probation for one year until he deemed her work worthy she would work whenever her guide required her to irrespective of the time and the day and notice the third point the third point said that she will not spoil the environment for other researchers now it was taken as a thing at isc at that time that uh, entrance of any women would probably spoil the environment of other researchers she can act as a distraction to the other male students now of course anyone would be feel very insulted because of these statements but kamla accepted it with a pinch of salt and then she proved that she was right and professor raman was wrong and she excelled in her field and it opened the doors of isc to uh, girl students forever and we now know uh, that it is one of the very best institutes in our own country now when later in her um, after she became an accomplished scientist she said that though raman was a great scientist he was very narrow minded and i can never forget the way he treated me because i was a woman and uh, she felt that the bias against women was so bad at that time and what can one expect even if a nobel laureate behaves in such a way so that was a thing so uh, but we should be thankful to her that she started this thing that women can enter into high end institutes later on for her exemplary work she was awarded the rashtrapati award and she was also appointed the director of the institute of science at mumbai but she was given that position four years later then she was what supposed to be given because of the existing gender bias in the scientific community uh next i would take the example of one woman who left her mark very well and she was none other than dr darshan ranganathan uh, she is darshan ranganathan she is uh, one of the she was one of the best biochemists at her time she had 16 jacks papers but she was never applauded properly she was never given her due credit she was never given her due credit now what was the thing is that uh, when she joined the place where her husband was also working dr subramanya ranganathan she was not given a, a faculty position over there because most of us know very well this uh, the problem the two body problem that uh, both the husband and wife are not uh, allowed uh, to work in the same institute so because her husband was always already there so so what she did was she uh, got many fellowships and she supported her whole throughout her research career was supported by her own fellowships so that was the kind of perseverance she had and that was the kind of passion she had for her work that she supported her uh, throughout her life in the end of course she got a, uh, she was a, she became a director at a, a big institute but early on she was never given that proper credit and she was diagnosed with cancer and died on the same day when she was born so but her husband was very helpful to her and they shared their lab space they shared the chemicals reagents and students and he said that she was a star for such a wonderful human being the end should come so early and so painfully is indeed a cruel twist of destiny and she fought her long suffering just as bravely and in her memory a biennial professor darshan ranganathan memorial lecture was also established by her husband which is to be delivered by a women scientist who has made outstanding contributions in any field of science and technology so this was one uh, scientist whom we missed giving her due credit and there must be many who are left out because of this bias now i'm com coming to a non indian uh, scientist uh, lise mitner so in her time the school schooling was not allowed in austria and then uh the main painful thing for her was despite we know that uh, we know that the nuclear fission for the nuclear fission 1944 nobel prize in chemistry was given to otto hahn 
but less people would know that actually it was not the uh, not the work of uh, only Otto Hahn, but it was actually Lise Meckner and Otto Hahn who had collectively done all those experiments for a long period of time and had the discovery of nuclear fission. She, she was also later called the mother of the bomb, but which she did not like it actually. But she was not chosen for the uh, Nobel Prize and only Otto Hahn was given the prize. And Otto Hahn also did not credit her for that work and she, he just mentioned her in the speech itself. So that actually, fe she felt injured by her omission and other scientists also shared this feeling of injustice that was done towards her, despite her being a very good scientist and for a great contributions that she had made. So that was an old story, but look at this graph. This is the Nobel Prize, this is the graph of the Nobel Prize winners between 1901 and 2020, okay? What do, you, what, what do we see here? We see here that the proportion, the, the comparison, you can see that the purple one is for the females and the green one is for the males. And you can see that there is a huge disparity, huge disparity, especially when it comes to size, the number of females goes even down further. So this is the statistics that we have for the Nobel Prize uh, if we compare men and women. Then we have, uh, we are very lucky, we have Padmashree Professor Rohini Godbole. She's working at uh, IISC and she's the honorary professor over there and she has been recognized for her work at CERN. She has been given the French National Highest Award of Merit. She serves as the chairperson of the panel for women in science by the Indian Academy of Sciences. She's also the author, one of the author of Leela Vati's Daughters. Now Leela Vati's Daughters, if you must have uh, read this book, this is a book about many Indian uh, great Indian women scientists. And we were also very lucky to have her uh, uh, to give this ninth Women in Science webinar, which I have at my university, Punjab University in Chandigarh. She spoke on diversity in science and roles that individual institutes and society can play. And it was a very good lecture that she gave and she gave a beautiful insight into what is the, what is the, what are the problems that we are facing and how we can overcome these challenges. And she said that there exists invisible biases, which I completely agree, they, they do exist, about what women can and cannot do and what women should and should not do. So there are many rules that are made for women that they should do this and they should not do this and what they can do and they what, what they cannot do. You must also have heard about Professor Gagandeep Kang. She was the first Indian woman scientist. She is the first Indian woman scientist to be inducted as the fellow of the Royal Society in its 359 years of history. She said that a woman taking a stand even without impinging on anyone else's labor problematic, rude or troublesome. She once also said that in a meeting which was dominated by men, she had to, they, so they, nobody was listening and she had to actually say that please keep quiet and I am the chairperson of this meeting. So we must think of what we are doing. Yeah, please, uh, there's a certain distance if you can mute yourself. Yeah, thank you. So Rohini Godbole, Professor Rohini Godbole said that 10 years after a theoretical physicist returned to India from the US where she completed a PhD, you know, Professor Godbole completed her PhD in physics from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Her male colleague once said that, I didn't realize, I didn't realize you were so serious about your research. Now this is a comment which she got after she uh, won this French award. And she said that my gender had some part to play in that assumption. This is an assumption, perhaps without him even realizing it. His comment wasn't meant as a put down, but rather as a positive statement. But statements such as this indicate the extent of invisible or unconscious bias. So the male colleague thought that uh, she was probably not very serious about her research until and unless she was actually awarded for her work. That is just because she was a She's a woman. And in fact, I must tell you that I was once listening to her lecture and she said that she was, uh, she was giving some lecture somewhere and a professor there, he said that, uh, no, so his, her uh, professor uh, took her to meet somebody else and that person, and he introduced her that, okay, she is uh, Professor Godbole. And the other person said that, Oh, great, I have read your husband's papers. He does a very nice work, piece of work. So he, just by Professor Godbole, he assumed that it must be a man and not a woman. And a woman can do such good research work. So 
So that was actually, yeah, very strange. It happens. It happens a lot of time. I will give you some more examples. We also face this. So John C. Williams has said that uh, has identified four basic patterns of this bias. So first is the prove it again pattern. Prove it again pattern means that women have to uh, keep on proving themselves, keep on proving themselves that they are equally as competent as their male counterparts. Then the second pattern is the tight rope. So they are expected, women are expected to behave in masculine ways to be perceived as competent, competent while still being expected to maintain their femininity. Then the third, and which is, I guess, the most important part is the maternal wall, which is the, which concerns the biases that are held against women with children in comparison to the women without children or men. So men, regardless of whether they have children or not. And then there is a tug of war, which involves a competition that can exist among women in organization. So this is a statistic for the postdoctoral. These are the statistics of present times. You see, the green one shows the 57% one are without the postdoc after their PhD, and 9%, only 9% are continuing their postdoc. 34% have completed their postdoc. This is the distribution of samples. Uh, sampled working women. So this is a report. Uh, this is again, I have taken a report from the uh, DBT. So we can see that the number of women in biological health and allied sciences are the maximum followed by phys physics and chemistry, followed by actually chemistry, right? So this is the distribution of women. And just two days before I was uh, reading this article in Nature, it was circulated a lot. The title says how mothers get penalized in the scientific race. Okay, so this is uh, this is a, this is the picture of a foundation actually the Isabel Trust, which is for the MOS, which means Mothers in Science. So uh, whenever a mother who is a scientist is involved in her research work, the most common statement that she has to hear is that she is neglecting her children. Whether she is or she is not, that is none of the business of other people, but definitely somebody will say that she is neglecting her children. Nobody knows that what effort she is putting in balancing her children, her work, her family, everything else, but very quick at judging, judging the women scientists. Yeah, so more fundamental problems, of course, women academics are judged a lot, while men are termed as decisive, strong and assertive. All of these are positive statements, but women aggressive or difficult. All of these are negative statements. And men who can speak up are termed as vocal, but men, uh, women who speak up uh, are termed as having some complaining problem. But on the good side, we can say that government of India is doing very well for in introducing new initiatives, refining the initiatives that are already there. For example, there is this uh, initiative, Gender Advancement for Transforming Institutions, Gati. So this is also a good um, initiative. Then Kiran Division is knowledge involvement in research advancement through nurturing. And this has women scientists, uh, A, B, and C3 schemes. In fact, this is especially for those who have had a break in their career due to some of the other reason, due to shifting or due to starting a family. Then I read somewhere that there are Udyam Shakti portal also for women's entrepreneurs. And there are examples such as Vigyan Jyoti program of the DST Chetna by the government of Karnataka. Then irrespective of the gender, there are various post PhD schemes, for example, Inspire Faculty Scheme, SCRB, uh, the NPDF scheme by SCRB and the CSI Nehru scheme, which the uh, uh, female scientists also can pursue, even if they don't get a permanent job after their PhD, they, for, the, for four to five years, they can continue their uh, research using these schemes. And local initiatives for should be there. For example, we have a local initiative at our university, which is called Women in Science. But the most wanted thing is the change in the social perspective. The social perspective must change. Uh, the, in the in a way that uh, scientists should not be termed as a man scientist or a women scientist, but a scientist who happens to be a woman, a scientist who happens to be a man, it should be gender irrespective. Now, I will, as suggested by uh, Dr. Kavita, I should talk about uh, the women in science and my journey and to inspire other uh, female scholars also and speak a little about my research work. So I will tell you a, a little bit about my own journey. So we are two sisters and our mother was always working throughout her life, whatever short life she had, she was always uh, working. Um, she was a teacher and we saw the struggles that she had to face while managing the 
family and the uh, and her job because she used to work out of station so she used to come every week to us on the weekends and but that made us independent so that thing taught us how to how to be independent how to do all our chores ourselves and not to depend upon anybody else now here the role of the man of the family so in this case our father is very important because he never interrupted her freedom he never he never told her that you should not be aspirational and do not go outside for work rather look after children so he played the role of a mother when she was not there with us she was working she he played because he was in station so he used to take care of us without and and we could never we never heard about any bias we never saw any bias when we were kids so till phd i never witnessed any kind of bias so that was the upbringing that mm -hmm. uh the uh, the biases i i started learning about the biases after the phd when i started my postdoc and when i found that you have to look for a postdoc in the same country as your husband is because of course everybody would want to stay with the family so uh, you know people have to sacrifice their uh, say good postdocs for average postdoc or something like that and there is always uh, there is not equal salary for men and women when it comes to postdoc for different schemes not in india i'm talking about certain countries abroad abroad so again there is invisible or unconscious bias when you apply when you saying that you are a women or if you saying you are a man so that kind of uh, bias you always see in your replies as well the challenges increase exponentially after motherhood because you have to take care of your kids also and you have to balance your family also and uh, the society always puts that whole pressure of uh, caring for the family on the mother so if a mother happens to be a scientist it becomes a huge herculean task i must say then the challenges for a permanent position in the same city so these are very basic and practical challenges that i am telling that every woman faces so this there are gender bias in everyday situations so so building a new lab developing a scientific research group so i was uh, i joined uh, for a permanent faculty position i joined an engineering institution in the applied sciences department uh, we know that engineering institutions are male dominated institutions so building a scientific lab in an engineering institute that too by a female faculty was one hell of a challenge for me but then i'm very very happy and proud to say that i did it and i did it very well and i'm thankful to those men and women who actually helped me for this at the same at my institutes so gender bias is always there in research submissions and acceptance we all know that that there there is bias leadership roles differences in gender distribution how many women do we see in the leadership roles very few women we will see in the uh, posts which are very high high posts so that is there examples of high profile meetings yes when we have high profile meetings you would always uh, we would always see that there is certain kind of uh, more inclination towards what are the suggestions of a male uh, colleague instead of a female colleague so this again points out to the social perspective rather than the actual performance then stereotyping of subjects i think this is uh, pretty bad so initially before the start of these uh, this lecture today professor brijesh rightly pointed out that we have stereotyped some of the things that uh, okay males should do for example he rightly said that we always first give the dolls to our daughter and the cars to our uh, boys to play with so i'm happy to say that uh, i have a son and daughter but i give them mix so my <laughs> <laughs> prefers to do that uh, doll things i don't i don't mind yesterday he was wearing a bangle and he was asking me how am i looking i said you are looking very nice and my daughter is always roaming and she's playing like a boy i i like it I, so it is our duty as as parents in fact as mother it is i think it is my duty i always tell my son that okay you have to work you have to work in the kitchen also because i don't want him to uh, inculcate in this thing in his mind that since he is a boy he will not work in the kitchen he he eats so he has to work because he eats in the same way as my daughter so that is the same thing irrespective of gender of all these things 
uh, of all the challenges after, after all if you face so many challenges if you do so much hard work you always get rewards and then you get happy by it so my first reward which i very much like is that my students get really inspired uh, the research scholars or the students the bem students they get really inspired when uh, when i achieve something so that gives me very much happiness so when day before yesterday i was actually preparing for my talk and i was in my office and my, one of my research scholar came to me and uh, she said i was talking to her about a new phd scholar that a new phd scholar is joining and she's a bit nervous about her interview so please help her so she said that ma'am do you remember when i had my interview you came um, and it was the day just uh, before the day of your delivery so the same day i was supposed to give birth to my second child and i had this phd interview of this girl and she said that when i saw that i was really surprised and i was telling my mother that look my supervisor has come for taking my interview despite the fact that she is going to deliver the next day so she said that i would have never come there she her mother also said i would have also not come there so then her mother said to her that look if your supervisor is working so hard for you you must also learn and you must also work that hard to prove that she was right in taking you so i was so happy to see that that the students really get inspired if you if you if you be like a role model to them because certainly he was right dr bujesh was right in saying that we do have a uh, very positive or uh, a huge positive of role models so in a very small small manner if we if we give some examples to our own students so they will carry that thing forward so it is after purjanto on fee ucho samne gosar lage bakule yal re jige islam koilo sir asla ke upre jata ho eta ek to what is happening what is please please take care uh, professor kavita please That's check you know yeah. someone yeah. some participants you know is on please uh, mute it down huh, please yeah, yeah you're going to be please meet you sorry nimisha sorry that's okay that's okay. it happens a lot in the online yeah yeah, yeah. that is purely an intention <laughs> <laughs> so uh, full utilization of time so uh, i think that because you have so many responsibilities so you manage your time very well so you don't end up wasting your time so i've seen that women actually do a good job in managing their time very well children getting empowered so when my kids see me working throughout the day and they see that i work at night and in the morning i handle them also and the work also they also feel that okay this is the way you should keep on working and uh, not sit idle then of course i said setting examples for other women scholars and students uh, like i completed so i sorry i sent you the old cv so i have completed the 10 research projects by now in 12 years this was only for and this along with this coincided with the family thing so so that that was only possible because i did not care about what the people say I, my my motto in life is just to focus on your own work and don't worry about what people are saying even if they say that uh, women should not be very aspirational this is what i uh, listen a lot that people come and say you should not aspire too much I, uh, you should not work too much you should not go into research so deeply but i don't care i do whatever i want to do i know i i'm good at uh, handling my family i know i'm good at my work so that doesn't bother me so i established a research group of my own on nano science and so uh, establishing a research group like i told it was very difficult because uh, i was what i was in my first appointment as the inspire faculty i was given a room which was closed for 20 years so i built up that room i had no lab so i requested for some lab space so some senior professor gave me some research space and and managed to get the most work done in that less small space as well and now uh, after a few years i was managed to build up my own lab from my own research grants so slowly step by step step by step so i still remember that i had only one beaker and one pipette when i entered into research and it published in uh, this journal called nanotechnology with only that one beaker and one pipette and those students who did that work they used to do the experiment they used to synthesize the nanoparticles in that beaker wash them reuse them wash that beaker reuse it wash the even the tips and reuse it but they they were the best students that i had i must say then it led to good publishing in good research papers in good journals and filing patents of course there are challenges every day being a woman you have to Uh, fight so many uh, prejudices 
but then eventually you get used to it and you know ways how to tackle all this sometimes you have to ignore a certain things sometimes you have to stand up to certain things and then i feel the most important is that you should always empower the other women you should not come uh, become a hurdle but you should always empower the other women as well so this was all about the thing which i wanted to say about the women in science because i feel very very strongly about it and now coming to very few, i will take very few minutes because i think we are already running late so uh, i will take a few minutes for getting uh, giving you some insights into the my research interests so uh, my research interests are mainly into the applications of the nanomaterials where we deal with the nobel metal nanoparticles semiconducting ones and we conjugate with them with the different kinds of biomolecules and use them for various kinds of applications so uh, these these are the kind of particles that we produce so i'm basically uh, from uh, for my um, i did my msc honors in chemistry phd was in some sort of immunology and chemistry uh, mixture and then my postdoc was in tissue cultures so i'm a jack of all trades and master of none i should say <laughs> so uh, this is the novel antibacterial nano conjugate based drug delivery uh, approach so we do uh, drug delivery using nanoparticles i will not go into the technical details because i don't think this is the right platform for that we can discuss about it some other day so a lot of work we are doing in collaboration i feel collaborations are very very important you cannot do everything on your own so we have some very good uh, departments in our university microbial department so we uh, collaborate with them and we have used our nanoparticles for treating various infections this is a work that we published in bioconjugate chemistry and it was for cationic um, um, peptide functionalized gold nanohybrids in cancer cells and uh, these are this is a image which i really like because a lot of effort goes into getting all this done now we have all this facility in my own lab because i faced a lot of problem in getting this done so i have built up my own cell culture lab i have built up my own microbial facility apart from the chemistry facilities and this was a work which was published in chemical engineering journal and uh, here we had actually you know uh, developed an anti nas um, what do you call it spray spray which could actually uh, bypass the blood brain barrier and it has polymerase nanoparticles and trh is encapsulated into this thyrotropin releasing hormone is encapsulated into these polymeric nanoparticles and this work was so good that it was selected as the cover page of this journal which is having a very high impact factor this journal and these are the biocompatibility drug release internalization studies intranasal delivery so this is sort of an inhaler sort of a thing for intranasal delivery and this is a new work that we has uh, started into the self assembly of amino acid and peptide and it is proving to be very promising and we have uh, published a few papers good papers and we have also filed uh, filed patents for this finally i would come to the acknowledgments i would like to wind it up now soon so i am very very thankful to the association of chemistry teachers and the organizers organizers of the international webinar this international webinar on women in science where i also learned a lot from the other uh, speakers i'm uh, thankful to the department of applied sciences uit and all the other collaborators all the places where i have worked for in this duration in this in the past uh, 15 years and my research scholars post doctoral uh, uh, fellows my family and well wishers and to the various funding agencies and inias also for because of inias uh, i'm here so i'm thankful to inias and i would uh, ended by saying this thing uh, if you know you are on the right track if you have this inner knowledge then nobody can turn you off no matter what they say so this was said by barbara she was the winner of 1983 nobel prize in physiology and medicine so with these words i would like to thank you again for this and uh, thank you very much thank you dr nishima uh, it was excellent and very inspiring uh, presentation uh, thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you thank you so much dr nishima and you really uh, boldly very boldly presented each and every real fact of life <laughs> on this yeah. platform i really appreciate you for this thing and really you inspired i think all the participants here on this platform the way you presented the flowchart of uh, by marking 
women who broke the glass ceiling and left their mark was really very appreciable on your part. And the tug of war that you told <laughs> that a woman has to face that a woman can only realize what she can face. So thank you so much for the commendable uh, work you have done in your research. And I really applaud you from this platform, the lab that you prepared for your own research work. Thank you so much for giving your valuable presence here. So now it's time to uh, end the session. So I would now like to request uh, Professor H. Swaminathan, Executive Council Member, ACT South Zone, to propose a vote of thanks to the illustrious participants. Um, speak, speaker, speaker is off, sir. Swaminathan, sir. Speaker, speaker, we cannot hear you, sir. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Are you audible now? Yeah, Hi, audible. Sir. Yes, sir, sir. So the president of the ACT, Professor Dujesh Pare, and uh, General Secretary, Dr. Prabhu, and all the invited speakers and organizers of the conference, and the participants, and invited speakers, and all these things, good evening to all of you. On behalf of ACT, I am really delighted to give a proposal word of thanks. And we heard a very nice lecture from four invited speakers. Yeah. Dr. Subha Ganonga has given a lecture on Nobel laureates and their work and their basic need, I mean, uh, science needed for sustainable growth. And we had a lecture from Sonu Gandhi from NAAB Hyderabad, the rapid detection of diseases and nano-sensors. Excellent work and excellent speaker. And we had a very nice lecture. And Dr. Lena Francis, actually principal of Indian School of Alsi, Muscat, has given really an adventurous life history of that Mary Curie. So we are really, you know, that all the participants are really, you know, very enjoyed the lectures. And finally, that Dr. Nishima Wangu has given a lecture on challenges and opportunities for the young, I mean, women scientists. I know Dr. Darsan Ranganathan and as well as Ranganathan because I was an IIT convert at that time. So she was a very dedicated scientist, Darsan Ranganathan. And she had actually given the challenges of these women scientists and also the opportunities for the women scientists. So we had a very nice lecture from the four, I mean, that uh, women, excellent lectures. We are really, uh, ACT is really thankful to all the four uh, speakers. And we are thankful to that Professor Pujesh Pare for initiating such kind of programs. And very nice and uh, making the ACT more visible. Oh, thank you. And, uh, <coughs> thank you. And thank Dr. Lagin D.V. Prabhu and for his ins inspiring guidance and motivation for organizing such type of, you know, that uh, activities, not only now, since the last two decades. So he was working for the last two decades for giving all these things. Thank you very much, sir. And I thank, you know, the ACT is very thankful to SRMIST, particularly these organizers of this uh, e-conference and Dr. Helen Kavita and uh, the Dean of Engineering Technology, Dr. I mean, uh, Muthukishnan. And we are thankful to all the organizers and also we are thankful to these ACT members, EC members and all the participants. Once again, I thank one and all. Thank you very much. And our, our, our master, our master of uh, ceremony yeah. today, Dr. Neet Kamal. Yeah, I thank uh, yeah. Dr. Neet Kamal for a very uh, sweet uh, master ceremony, I could say. Yeah. And it is very pleasant uh, listening to you. And it is a good job. You have done a very good job. So thank you, Supa. Thank you. Thank you, Nishima. Thank you, Sonu. And uh, and thank you, Dr. Lena. It was really wonderful. And really, we enjoyed it, really. And all the participants really very mesmerizing. Thank you. And please keep in touch with us, please. Thank you very and much. And definitely in touch, we'll be in touch with you. Thank you. Hope to see you some. It's our pleasure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Sonu. Dr. Sonu, yeah, yeah. Very good piece of research. Then uh, Dr. Super, you know, uh, will you please, you know, just on the on the lighter side, uh, pronunciate your surname. What what to say after Supa? Hanau Bua. Hanau Bua. Yes, correct. Oh, wonderful. Now, yes, very good. So, I learned it now. I learned it. Okay, That's thank wonderful. you. Okay, thank I you. I really so nice enjoy. Time. Yeah, really enjoy. And thank you very much for invitation. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah, you yeah. can do a thing more next, uh, please let me know. I would yeah, like sure, to join. Sure, sure, sure. Thank, Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you Professor Pare and Dr. Kavita. Pare. Yeah, hello. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Sudha Jain is there, our past president now. 
professor sudha jain she has just joined and she is our past president thank you madam for joining no your your voice is not your voice is not uh, voice voice is not we cannot heard maybe speaker right. speaker okay. Okay. you are muted anyway yeah but thank you thank so you for coming national anthem yeah national anthem okay we have start. national anthem start we meet kamal you can just yeah. announce it yeah. and let's now uh, we let all of us stand for the national anthem i request all the participants please stand for the national anthem I think it is over. Yeah, it's over. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shai was from the very beginning. I was. Okay, attending. okay. Thank you, thank you for joining. Okay, thank Shubha, you. I just wanted to remind you. Yeah, yeah. Ninety-seven, nineteen eighty-seven. I have attended that first uh, congress okay. on this 